Okay, you are now co-host, and I will spotlight you when, when you start, because then you can, um, and everybody will see you. Uh, okay. David or Karen or somebody uh, want to introduce him? That'd be nice. Okay, this is Ross Braddy. Record again. In progress. Okay, hi Ross and Martha uh, for everybody that's with us so far, um, they will have read uh, the introduction of you in the newsletter. Uh, you've seen a bit of, uh, well, you have a significant presence online talking about not just this, but a number of other things something you can certainly tell i think we'd all be curious to know about your background how long you've been doing this what led you into it and uh nowhere did it mention what state you're in i know mm. you're not local yeah okay great thank you for the intro i appreciate that um so uh yeah i guess we could start off by a little intro here my name is ross Ross Ratty, and um, I've been growing figs for about seven years now. Um, in those seven years, though, I've been totally obsessed. So I'm sure a lot of you guys know what that, that could feel like. Uh, in that time, um, I've inspired, educated, and shared the love of growing figs with thousands of people um, through my YouTube channel. If anyone that's interested, you could check it out. It's just youtube.com slash Ross Ratty, my first and last name. I also have a blog, which we're going to be looking at here uh, for the majority of the presentation. Um, I've also helped people through consultations, and um, I also have a podcast. So um, I've dedicated quite a bit of my time in my 20s. I'm only 30 years old um, to try to ripen high quality figs in the Philadelphia area. Um, so I live here in Philadelphia in the suburbs. Um, and you know, while I'm not, I think, in California, uh, there's a lot of observations I think that I've made over the years that can certainly translate well to growers in California or other parts of the world. Um, I try to really focus my channel on not just people who are in the Northeast, but people all over the, the world, uh, as I have many viewers in different countries and many viewers in different parts of the, of the country. Um, so Philadelphia really is far from the perfect fig climate. Um, it's a great place to learn about them, though, I think, because, you know, I'm right on the edge of um, really something terrible happening or something fantastic happening uh, almost every year. Uh, for an example, we have, you know, winter lows that can reach zero degrees Fahrenheit. And at zero degrees Fahrenheit, you could see total dieback of the ma overwhelming majority of fig trees. Or I can have like this year, you know, we only saw about a 14 degree low. And it's, you know, in that sense, it's quite mild and actually all of the fig trees in my yard survived. So, you know, we're right on the edge of like uh, good things happening and bad things happening. You can really observe, I think, uh, you know, these you make these careful observations based on those those differences. Uh, another one is as an example is rain and that you could probably see from the window behind me. It's pretty dreary outside and it's just been raining pretty much nonstop on and off for the last 10 days and that rain really affects the quality here so i've sort of made it my mission like i said really trying to do this in the last seven years of trying to figure out well how can i even grow figs in this very humid climate because that's really the biggest killer other than getting them through the winter time um and i know you guys don't have to worry about that in california for the most part i mean it depends on where you guys are we're at but you know, uh, it'd be nice to live in a place that's so dry that I could ripen super awesome fruits and um, enjoy them. But, you know, just uh, as an example, a couple weeks ago, um, I did actually have some fruits that were pretty much drying on the tree. So with enough, you know, genetic diversity that exists within Ficus carica, it's really special to be able to find some varieties that can perform exceptionally well here. Uh, and I've even, I've tasted figs that were ripened in California, were dry farmed in California, were caprified. And uh, some of the fruits I can ripen here, if you really know what you're doing, can rival the quality of California. But obviously it's not every fruit. It's kind of one in every, I don't know, 
uh, it's just really is a really condensed part of the season. But for the fruits that I do get in that condensed part of the season that rival the quality of California, my eyes just light up. And every time I think, wow, no wonder I have spent all this time growing figs. Um, so I really enjoy them. Um, and I will just wrap that point up by saying that, you know, I've even, uh, I would just say in terms of location, if you want to grow figs, there's a, if there's a will, there's a way, right? Uh, I even helped, uh, helped consult, um, a grower who wanted to start a commercial fig operation in Ireland. And, you know, Ireland is probably the opposite of what you would think of as a, as a great location for figs because they just don't get a lot of heat. It's quite mild and they also don't get a lot of sun, but I just talked to him actually a couple of days ago. I reached out to him to see how he was doing. And believe it or not, he's able to ripen main crop figs in early August. So I think the fig is just, in my mind, it's it's such an incredible fruit. Um, and you know what? There's people all over the world, like commercial growers in Malaysia, which is a tropical location. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's just if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, a lot of people ask me over the years why I have been so invested in figs over the years. And I can tell you that the simple answer is, uh, to my taste buds, they're one of the most incredible things nature has ever created. Uh, in you know, my opinion, a lot of people say this actually is that they're kind of like jam on a tree. Uh, some varieties, I would even say that they're kind of like cake on a tree. Um, some taste like marshmallows, brown sugar, dates, raisins. They can taste like hints of every berry I've ever had, and they even produce their own nectar. Usually that's visible uh, in the void of the fig or at the eye of the fig. And that nectar I often refer to as honey because it really does resemble honey. Um, but some figs produce a nectar that, you know, more so resembles and in, you know, visual appearance, but also in flavor to something like maple syrup or caramel, agave or other interesting sugar flavors. Um, so not only am I in love with the flavor, though, I'm absolutely in love with how challenging they are and how intricate they can be. Each time I think uh, all I know, you know, every, each time I think that I know everything there is to know about growing figs, I then learn something new and I think, holy crap, you know, it's just it's just next level and next level. And it just constantly keeps surprising me. Um, so it's you know, it's a very intellectually stimulating fruit, especially in a more challenging climate like my own. Um, and the further down the rabbit hole I go, the more I learned about nature myself, um, how the world works, and at its core, how everything is in some way related to each other. Um, and over the years, I've experimented with hundreds of varieties, um, many different ways of growing figs in different forms, different spacings, different planting depths, um, greatly restricting water, growing them in less sunlight, growing them in more sunlight, growing them in the ground, in containers, pretty much in every way you can imagine. Um, and, you know, just to wrap up my intro here, I do think it's uh, it's quite an awesome honor to be here with you guys, the California Rare Fruit Growers, because, you know, I've been a rare fruit grower for, you know, the last seven years, and I've really been uh, obsessed with not just figs, but so many other fruits and varieties that, uh, you know, it's just, it really is amazing. Um, so it's awesome that there are organizations, uh, you know, across the country that uh, have such a passion for this kind of thing. It's really important. And uh, in today's presentation, I'd like to chat with you guys about mostly the many intricate little details of growing figs that I've learned over the years. But I'm also going to really get into at the end of this talk about the amazing genetic diversity that is within Ficus carica, uh, which will lead us into flavors and textures and other special characteristics that uh, these figs possess. So that's the intro there, guys. I'm going to... Um, Share my screen now. Okay. So this is my blog for anyone that's interested. It's figboss.com. It's kind of my little brand there because my name is Ross. It's uh, always been called Ross the Boss as a kid, so it makes some sense, right? Um, all right. So, uh, oh, by the way, you know, I want to give you guys one little story that I think a lot of you guys would appreciate before I get into this. Um, how I sort of got into the the fruit um, or growing food in general was that my grandfather one day he's a you know eighty at this time at this point he's an eighty eight year old uh, Italian immigrant 
and um, he uh, he came over the house one day when I was about 15. So about 15 years ago, he came over the house and he he brought these really long branches with him. And I opened the door because he didn't have a key, and he he's like standing there with these long four foot long branches and I'm t- I'm thinking to myself, you know, I was taught as a kid not to bring the outside in, right? Don't bring nature inside because that's just it's off limits. And so he put but he had these branches and he's known for doing just crazy things. So he's like, "Ross, get out of the way. I'll, <laughs> I'll show you what I'm doing. Give me a minute." And he eventually goes out into the backyard and um start lo- starts looking around for a spot and eventually sticks the the branches in the ground and I was like grandpa what are you what are you doing like tell me what what is happening right now and he just explained to me that those little sticks those big branches will turn into fig trees so at that moment i think really uh just you know i planted a seed in my mind that this is even possible or this is pretty cool and um i always loved growing fig or i always liked eating figs specifically dried figs i never had a fresh fig until i was about 20 three or so um and i thought you know we i work in my basement as an accountant actually that's my full-time job and um one year the the basement got flooded and we had a moldy smell and i just quickly looked up well how do you find um you know ways to get rid of this moldy smell and i learned that plants can purify the air and there's specific plants so i got into house plants started growing all these house plants i got pretty good at it and then i said to myself why am I growing all these house plants? I should be growing something that, you know, can give me something in return, right? Something that I can actually enjoy and eat. And figs was the first thought because they're so hard to find in the store or they're expensive. At least here, they're they're hard to find in the store. And I never even had a fresh fig. You know, maybe you guys have growing up if you lived in California, but around this part of the country, it's just so hard to find. Um, so, I thought, oh, let's just grow figs. Of course, my grandfather did this years ago. He introduced me to the whole thing, and now, ever since then, I've been kind of obsessed. So, yeah. So we're let's talk now about, um, you know, a lot of the uh, different um, basics of growing figs and some of the more intricate details. I think a lot of you guys might be very interested to hear about that you don't really hear in the average uh, article about figs or the average. Uh, thing you know in your everyday life of just reading about some fruit so uh and you know water we'll begin with water is that water is really the on or off switch for the growth and now i know you need nitrogen that certainly helps uh you know vegetative growth but if you wanted to really switch your fig tree in a mode of growing you just give it a lot of water if you want to stop it from growing you stop the water and in fact the fig tree is so drought tolerant, um, it's pretty incredible that it's almost like a cactus. It really stores a lot of its water in the branches and in the trunks of the tree um, and can survive in pretty much entirely dry conditions for an extended period of time, for months. Um, it'll drop all of its leaves, it'll go into this preservation mode and sort of prepare for, for drought. Um, and you know what it's important to note i think people don't necessarily understand this is that you know not only is the water being stored in the branches and in the trunks and in other parts of the tree but it's also being stored in the fruits so if you were to heavily water your fig trees at the time that they're ripening specifically but even after fruit set when the when the little fruits form on the tree they're even small pea-sized little figs you're contributing in some way in an excess of water to actually having a lower bricks down the road when you actually get the ripe fruits. So every little amount counts along the way. And then if you can really just give the tree enough water to be happy and healthy and that's it, uh, you will have the highest bricks you could possibly have uh, from that particular tree. So I've certainly noticed that here with a lot of my trees and how I get 40 inches of rain annually in the Philadelphia area. And a lot of that, unfortunately, can happen in the summer when these figs are ripening. So uh, I've done experiments in the past where um, I have uh, grown my fig trees in containers and I have uh, wrapped plastic bags around the container so that I'm limiting 100% of the water 
uh, from outside sources like rain from getting into the soil. And, and then I have a drip timer that waters exactly how much water I wanted to give the tree. And now I know based on, you know, just comparing differences in years and comparing the bricks of some of these fruits and how great they taste. It's obvious to me that, uh, you know, the difference in bricks is clear and, uh, you just have to really control that water if you want to have a higher quality piece of fruit. Um, so you guys probably don't have much problem with that, but, uh, you know, in terms of how much water, a lot of people ask me this all the time. And I just say, put your hand in the soil, you know, um, if you want more water, you want more growth, excuse me, then give it more water. If you want less growth, then stop the water. Um, young fig trees are very prone to root rot though. And this is a very common problem with yellowing or browning leaves. I see all the time. A lot of people send me photos of their trees and say, Hey Ross, what's wrong with my tree? Um, so, you know, that's a big one. And you know, that just involves just getting a green thumb over time. Um, pay attention to the soil temperatures. You know, a lot of these things really determine how much, uh, you're going to need to water. Um, so give, give your trees. I would highly recommend a well draining soil. Um, that's got a lot of air in it, you know, cause they are pretty prone to that root rot with very fibrous roots that they tend to have. And a lot of that is on the surface. Um, so another thing that I think is interesting is that if you have too much water that can contribute to splitting and we'll get into that maybe a little bit later. Uh, but certainly in the soil moisture that really adds up over time, um, and can contribute to splitting. A lack of water is a common cause of fruit drop. I get this question a lot, especially maybe a lot of you guys just don't have enough water and might say, well, why are my fruits dropping? Either that's a pollination issue, which is less common, um, or it's usually a lack of water. Uh, rehydrating the roots can really help your fig tree wake up from dormancy. And just in general, my recommendation for water is just water well early in the season or you know, let's say in the winter time or in the fall, um, prior to fruit set, and then significantly decrease that amount of water after fruit set only enough to keep your tree happy and healthy. And then again, potentially lowering it even further three months prior to the winter time or your first frost to help lignify the new branches in preparation. And, uh, whatever you do, just make sure it's consistent. You know, that's the biggest one is that Again, if you if you have a, a lot of water at one time, that's going to really contribute to splitting. This, by the way, here is a fruit I harvested uh, yesterday, I think. Uh, it's called Black Celeste. It's a type of Celeste. It's an heirloom. Um, it's really beautiful, and you can see the inside's almost black. And uh, that's not always the case, I think, because of the, the rain we've had a little bit is contributing to the coloration there on the pith, which is the exterior of the fig here it's it's right inside the skin it's called the pith but this fig in general has extremely high pigmentation it's really insane um uh some other figs that are like that are violet de bordeaux and ruchiola de elba they have this amazing antioxidant pigmentation to them that uh give them this color this one to me tasted like a blackberry um, so the food, talk about fertilizer. Uh, I like to recommend that just fertilize your trees prior to fruit set. So time your feedings with future fruits in mind. Um, I think personally that nitrogen is really, uh, excess of nitrogen can really lower the quality of your figs. So what they can do is if you have too much nitrogen as the figs are ripening, um, you can, you can see an increase of cracking in your fruits. So um those cracks although they are beautiful and uh maybe if i have a photo here this thing at the top is kind of in the way ah oh, here we go so here's a photo here of black madeira as an example and you can see the the fruit has some cracks down the side and this is just not ideal yeah, it's beautiful, gives the fruit some character, maybe isn't even a descriptor for identifying it, but it's just not uh, something you want, you know, in terms of having the best possible fruits on your tree. So if you're seeing a lot of this, a lot of that is uh, based on the variety, but it's also contributed heavily by an excess of nitrogen. So you don't want this. And in fact, if you see this, this can turn much worse and actually create 
um, splitting, even though splitting is typically formed at the eye, uh, you can see large cracks form here on the fig, which then open up and expose the interior to the outside elements. So it's something to pay attention to. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, the other thing that can happen, by the way, is that um, you can have excess of nitrogen contributes to something called mule figs or daloso figs, which can also lower quality. And this is what a, a mule fig here looks like. This is a variety actually called daloso, which is a very rare Italian variety that has been described in Galicio's drawings many years ago when he was going throughout Italy and um, documenting and drawing a lot of the common fruit varieties that were present and describing them um, all throughout Italy. And this was one of them that was sort of lost for a bit, or at least it could still be lost. But the point is, is that it forms, it forms this weird thing here where it's like two figs in one and that you have a bottom portion here that's like a separate fig. And then you have a upper portion here that's another separate fig and this again is just it's nice to look at it's cool it's a nice little you know misnomer thing but again it's contributing to you know lower quality um so yeah i think that's just something to pay attention to um i would cover you know just in general a great recommendation obviously is just to cover your your trace minerals your micronutrients if you have any deficiencies correct that immediately um Figs love calcium and magnesium specifically. I personally really am a big fan of something called silica, which is, uh, I've been seeing some pretty good disease resistance in humid locations to something called rust, which can really be a problem in the South. Um, I think it's worth experimenting with that a bit more and seeing you know, what else it can possibly do for our figs. Uh, the soil pH obviously is quite critical. You wanna pay attention to that. You know once a year or twice a year but figs can handle a pretty wide uh range of soil ph but i like to go between six and seven point five that's just what i would recommend my soil here native is six um, i have grown figs in containers though above 7.5 and i just wouldn't recommend that um, i saw some pretty interesting um deficiencies at the time when my containers had a a four inch layer of, of lime on top of their containers. This was something that the DePaulo brothers um, was a big nursery here in Staten Island in the Northeast of, uh, of the United States. They had a big fig nursery and that was one of the things that they recommended. And it depends on the type of lime that you use, but one that is very quick acting and really changed the soil pH very quickly is not a good idea and if you're, you're over 7.5 what i noticed is that you're going to see a lot of fig mosaic virus symptoms and usually a fig mosaic virus if you're seeing a lot of those symptoms it's because your tree is just not very healthy um, so the soil is not healthy and then it's affecting the tree and um, so i had to go back i had to sort of you know get away from that one interesting thing i think because figs really do love limestone soils. They love the calcium. They love magnesium. Um, I would think it's a nice little experiment to grow fig trees in a container where the bottom four inches of the container is limestone. And then the rest of the container is, is soil. And that could mimic, you know, something that's, uh, you know, a more native soil uh, to the fig tree. And it could have interesting effects on the, um, the fruit quality. So let's move on now to, to the sunlight. Um, the sun's really critical, and I think the general recommendation is eight hours of light, right? Or give it as much hours as you can. Nice, Pierre. It's just not specific enough, unfortunately, in that you really need, every single variety needs a specific amount of sunlight, um, a specific amount of intensity of sunlight, and a specific amount of hours, or a combination of the both. Not exactly sure how to really really quantify this to people exactly but every variety is very different in that requirement once that requirement is met the fruit buds will form along the fruiting branches the fruiting branches are the new branches of the season that's where the main crop forms and a lot of us are focused on that main crop um, crop of figs so if we um, have enough sunlight hitting the fruit buds 
or where the fruit buds form along those branches as the tree grows, that's really critical as well, then those fruit buds will form. It's very difficult to go back in time and let's say take a fig tree that was in six hours of light, it's in a container, move it then to 12 hours of light every day and expect it to then suddenly fruit on all these prior fruit buds that should have existed but never existed because those fruit buds have to form as the tree grows. And you can see here, this is kind of what they, what these nodes look like or where they're located is that the leaf stem, where that leaf stem attaches to the branch, this fruiting branch, you will see two dots. And if you really got your glasses on, you can really see well, you'll be able to see at a very early stage, well before this, the beginnings of fruit formation. Um, and it, you can even get a microscope out and that's kind of how they've done it scientifically. You've seen the fruit buds form um, on a microscopic level and they just continue to get larger and larger until they form into something like this, which is visible to the eye or more visible to the eye. Uh, this is what you're looking for to see that your figs are getting enough light. It's if you don't have these double dots present, almost always it is just a lack of sunlight. And, you know, it's not maybe a lack of sunlight in terms of, well, my tree is in 12 hours of light, but it's still not getting those fruit buds, right? Well, it could just be your, your tree is very dense. The canopy is shading itself out and... Um, you know, some of the things that I like to do to recommend to people and I do myself to help get your tree more access to maximize the sunlight um, that your tree can reach is to do things like thinning. So at the beginning of the season, you could very easily just rub off a lot of the new shoots. As soon as they, they break bud, it's kind of in a sense a, a form of, uh, of pruning and you just rub off the branches you don't want. You think ahead in the future and you say to yourself, all right, well, you know, this branch is going to grow out in this direction. This branch is going to grow out in this direction. And in, in, you know, two months, I'm going to have fruit. And this is what the tree is going to look like. And if I have one branch, let's say right in the middle, that is shading the other two out, that's not good, right? So you want to think ahead of the game and actually thin out some of the shoots potentially. It depends on the variety. It depends on your location. It depends on how much light you get, et cetera. So that's a big one. Um, the other things I like to do is stake the branches, really open up the canopy, form uh, something like an open center, I think is a great form, or even a, uh, a Japanese espalier a or a low cordon, or even just an espalier in general. They're such great forms for the fig tree because they really can um, allow better access of sunlight to those fruiting branches to make sure that they're going to fruit. So that's really critical there. Um, uh, really production, by the way, to see how productive your fig tree can be is defined by how much of a maximization of sunlight you are giving your tree. So if you can maximize the sunlight as to your best of your ability, you're going to have the highest production possible. Um, which gives, you know, an interesting little thought that I had this year, uh, with my trees, because I'm growing my fig trees, by the way, a lot of them are in the ground. A lot of them are in containers. Uh, about half in the, half each, you know, in each way. Um, but I have uh, about 100 fig trees planted in the ground. And how am I able to obtain 100 fig trees in the ground uh, in such a small space? Because my property is only a third of an acre. And it's I'm growing in much less than that. Well, I've spaced my fig trees about two foot on center. How crazy is that? Um, so you could, you could space them very closely, but what you have to really pay attention to is if you're going to space them that clo closely is getting each individual tree and each individual fruiting branch, the appropriate amount of light that they need to actually set the fruits. If you make the mistake at that point as the grower, and you're seeing exactly how close you can plant these things and how exactly how close these fruiting branches can be to each other, you're going to get a great idea of you know, um, how productive these fig trees can be, right? Because if you have, let's say in a given area, your fig tree has 20 fruiting branches, right? Along those 20 fruiting branches, let's say you have 10 fruits a piece or five fruits a piece, right? Um, on a different tree, let's say you may average a different amount of fruiting, uh, fruits on those fruiting branches, but in a given area, in that same given area where we had 20 fruiting branches, instead, we have a variety that is really well adapted to lower light conditions. 
and doesn't mind actually having less light and will still be able to fruit in a less light environment. So if you have a situation like that, even if you're growing your fig trees in 10 or 12 hours of light, you could still have instead of 20 fruiting branches in that given area, you can have, let's say, maybe 30. And therefore, along those fruiting branches, you're going to have roughly this a similar amount of fruit. And obviously, that depends on the variety. But usually, the more fruiting branches you can have in a given area, the more production you're going to have. So uh, I think that's a really interesting little observation I made this year is that by planting them so close and really pay attention, paying attention to this light, I've been able to really hone in on what varieties require more light than others, and therefore making a pretty good observation on how productive they could potentially be, even in an environment that is much more has much more light than I get. I only get about six or seven hours to eight hours of light, depending on where my fig trees are. Um, and even if I had them in 12 hours or 14 hours a day, whatever it is, um, you know, they're going to be so much more productive if they can fruit well in this lower light environment that I have them in. So it's an interesting little thought, um, thought experiment that I've been kind of playing around with. Um, let's move on to temperature. The, you know, fig trees can survive temperatures of zero degrees Fahrenheit and also 130 degrees Fahrenheit for very brief periods of time. Um, I've experienced both here just by using my greenhouse and realizing, oh my God, it's too hot in there. I need to open up the door, open up the windows. Um, and they don't like it at that, those warm temperatures, you know? Um, so certainly I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, they're, they're pretty good at temperatures over a hundred for, you know, not extended periods of time. Um, and also at zero degrees Fahrenheit, there are quite a few varieties that can withstand those temperatures, assuming they have good lignification. Um, there are some varieties that even said to withstand negative five degrees Fahrenheit, uh, but those are both mostly unproven at this point. A lot of growers uh, haven't had enough time with them or experience with them yet um, to really confirm other, um, you know, other people's claims. Um, I would say though five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit is a much safer temperature for fig trees and the majority of them will survive about 15 degrees Fahrenheit um, of a winter low. Now this is of course assuming you have good lignification and I can, I believe that better lignification is not, you can visibly see it. It's not just the color of the wood, you know, is if it's green or half green and half brown, that's obviously not great. The browner it is, the better it is. Uh, obviously maybe at you guys where you're at, you might not see brown wood. You may see silver wood or gray wood that's approaching the, the appearance of a two-year-old piece of wood. But uh, I actually, I believe that you may end up seeing a, a shriveled appearance to the wood. And that really, I think, contributes to even better uh, lignification. So uh, the optimal soil temperature for the trees are about 78 degrees Fahrenheit. This is also really great temperature for doing propagation like air layering and grafting and rooting. Um, this is what I try to focus on in my short season climate and colder places that I tell people is to really focus on warming the soil early in the spring for people in Northern California, for people in the Pacific Northwest. This is absolutely critical, absolutely critical depending on where you guys live in those, in those areas. Um, warming the soil in the spring is exponentially going to affect your fig tree later on in the season to have earlier fruits, more fruits, a larger tree, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, getting your fig tree off on the right foot at the beginning of the season is the easiest at that time to warm the soil. Um, and there's many ways to increase the soil temperature, right? Um, you can plant your trees in a sunny location. You can plant your trees above grade. Um, I have experimented, by the way, planting my trees in root balls that are one to two foot high uh, above grade in mounds. And I have a grower, there's actually a really well-known grower 20 minutes from me in, in Jersey that plants all of his fig trees in those mounds. And he has great success ripening even what you would consider very late to ripen varieties here in our very short season climate. You know, we only have about 180 frost-free days. Um, and some varieties take about 120 days once you visibly see the fruit on the tree to actually ripen. 
So if you've already, you got 120 days dedicated just to seeing it ripen, uh, how is he doing that? You know, it's pretty incredible. Um, and it really just revolves around these warmer soil temperatures. Anybody in the Pacific Northwest or in these colder, dark, dreary, sad places in the Pacific Northwest that don't get enough sun, you know, places like the United Kingdom, you know, places like um, coastal areas of California, um, you know, you're really going to want to really increase those soil temperatures. It's really critical to pay attention to that. Um, and you're going to have so much more success. Um, you're not going to believe it. So that's why I've been able to really help my a friend of mine who I did some consultation work for. And he was he has a commercial fig orchard in Ireland. And that's, you know, as worse as it almost can get for growing figs. So um, yeah, increasing the soil temperature is critical. And uh, another ways you can do it is making use of thermal mass and also using uh, black nursery plastic as a, as a ground cover. Um, pruning, we sort of touched on this already. It really should be focused on maximizing light. So the light is absolutely critical. We're th every cut we make, we think ahead of time and think, where does the, how is the light going to affect this tree next year? How am I going to maximize the light next year? Um, we also, of course, you might want to do some pruning to form the desired shape of the tree. There's many forms, obviously, you can go with. Espaillets are fantastic. Highly recommend it for any hobbyist. Even commercial growers, I think they're probably the best or close to the best. Um, maintaining the health of the tree uh, after the desired shape is achieved is also critical. So renewing that um, fruiting wood every year and also cutting out some of the dead stuff to really help make sure it's going to stay healthy. Um, I like to do this during dormancy. You can do this at any time of the year, really. You can prune during the summer. I don't recommend it. But personally, I think for the, the health of the tree, I think it's best to wait until the sap flow has returned mostly to the roots. Um, and there's very little sap flow in the, in the branches of the tree. Um, you know, you don't want to lose that sap flow because that's where all the, or you don't want to lose that sap. That's a lot of where the carbohydrates are and the sugars are. And that's just, it's just great for the health of the tree to keep that. Um, so pruning, um, another way of pruning that we can think about pruning is summer pruning. And this to me though, is not your typical, your typical way of thinking about summer pruning that we would think about in other fruit trees where you might take a, a third of the growth away you might take um even a half of the growth away i mean you can even considerably cut your trees and continue to keep them in check to keep them at a specific height on a lot of other fruit trees but because the the fig is different and then it fruits on that growth the new growth um, the more growth you have the more figs you could potentially have so you don't want to necessarily do that is cut out a lot of that growth and of course i mentioned about the sap flow we want to keep that but there is something called pinching where we just very simply remove the apical bud. And this is a good demonstration here is that you can see this branch is missing its apical bud. The apical bud is just the uppermost part of the branches. If you can remove that with your thumb, and that's why people call it pinching is that you can remove it with your thumb. It's that soft it is really not lignified or it shouldn't have lignified. You can just remove it with your thumb. You can do it with uh, pruning shears. And then what this essentially does for you, it can ripen your harvest about two weeks earlier. I still debate on that one fact. Um, it's still kind of a big debate in my mind as to whether or not that's exactly true, but at least so far I've been seeing that to be the case. Uh, it also improves the quality, I think, the fruit quality of the main crop, um, simply because if you're removing the apical bud, you have less leaves and that that light is able to better hit those fruits and you're able to have a higher quality bricks that way. Um, it can also increase the quality of the Brava crop because there's something called Argent teal pruning, which, um, you know, Montserrat Pons, for anyone that doesn't know, if you're not really familiar with this gentleman, he's a Spanish grower. Um, he's probably the most highly regarded fig grower uh, living today. And he has written a book. It's called Fig Trees of the Balearic Islands. I actually have it right here. And this is a great read for anyone interested. And he has in his book many different methods of pruning for different reasons. And one of them is for Breba production. And he says in his book very simply that if you can remove the apical bud in the spring 
um, after the buds have broken and they're starting to grow, remove the apical bud, allow the lateral buds lower down on the tree. So if the apical bud was right here, we remove this, and then these lateral buds are allowed to grow. We let these, these grow, but what this does is, this is gonna change sort of where the energy in the tree is being directed. And instead it's going to be put into these brabas just a little bit more. And that is gonna increase the size and increase the quality of the brabas. So that's one way, one interesting little way of pruning your trees. And you could technically say that's summer pruning, right? You could technically say that's kind of pinching. It's during the growing season, I guess. Um, you know, uh, another way you can do it, another method of pruning he, re he recommends is called argentile pruning. And I've done this here many years, actually. Um, this is not really recommended for people, though, in shorter season climates because what argentile pruning is going to do is you're going to pinch your, your branches. <clears throat> Let's say for you guys in California, you might do this sometime in May. Let's say middle of May, you're going to pinch off the branches and you're going to use in conjunction with the pinching, you're going to use food and water. And you're going to give your tree specifically a lot of water at this point, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your fig tree to grow. You don't want it to stop at this point, because what pinching can do and should do in the summer pruning is that it's changing the hormones of the tree, right? we are <clears throat> intervening in some way and we're allowing the fruits to form. So by changing these hormones, we're changing the dominance and we're allowing new branches to come out from that particular branch that we changed the hormones on. So two things are happening, right? You're forming fruits and you're forming new branches. So if you can form new branches and allow them to continue to grow throughout the season with the addition of water, you're then going to have a much higher production. And I estimate um, it's at least 100% higher production over the course of the season. Um, I actually estimate here it's about 140 to 150% on my trees, and that's in Philadelphia. I mean, that's kind of insane. My trees here have such a heavy soil. It's such a heavy clay with so much water in it that I don't have to water them almost ever. What happens is they have so much access to that to that water as i said it's the on or off switch of growth right so if you're continuing that water you remove the apical bud you're then going to see all these new branches form and typically it's three or four new branches so you're temporarily stopping the growth you're temporarily telling the tree hey form the figs that are currently on the tree let them ripen they're going to ripen let's say if you you pinch in mid-may <clears throat> They may give you an earlier uh, production that is in between the Braba crop and in between the first set of main crops. So you might be extending your season or filling a gap of your season. And that's actually how um, I believe Pons describes in his book, if I'm not mistaken. You're fulfilling a gap of your season where there just isn't many figs um, in between that Braba and the first main crops. So if you do that, you're going to get earlier, earlier main crops, you fulfill the gap. And then, of course, you're then going to ripen a much later crop of figs because on these new branches that I discussed, you're then going to have more fruits form on those branches. So as I said, right, in a particular given area, the more fruiting branches you have, potentially the higher your production can be given the right amount of sunlight. So if you have three to four new branches, you're turning one fruiting branch now into three or four. On those new fruiting branches, you're going to have all these new fruits. And I believe... If my math is correct and what I've seen here is correct, it's at least 100% more production on your trees. But of course, you got to be really good at this. You got to be really skilled and you got to know what you're doing in terms of water. You got to know everything there is to know about figs, I think, to really make this work. Um, so that's one interesting little point, And that's something, again, called uh, rivers pruning. So if you time your you're pruning with a uh, conjunction of food and water for a timed second harvest that ripens later down in the season. Again, extending your harvest later down the season. Um, you can see higher production and an, an extension of your harvest as well. And then I also believe that pinching can nudge just very stubborn trees into fruiting sometimes. Sometimes they form the fruiting buds, the fruit buds, excuse me, on the fruiting branches, but they just don't grow. They just don't continue to actually expand and form visible figs it's weird how that happens i don't fully understand it but i can tell you that pinching sometimes gives them a little bit of a push into actually fruiting um 
So another thing that's uh, interesting here is called uh, rejuvenation pruning. So this is focused on making your tree healthier. And fig mosaic virus is uh, largely, I would say, a non-issue for a healthy fig tree. Um, but that's a healthy fig tree. And uh, I would say most, if not all, of the fig trees have fig mosaic virus. It's pretty rare not to even have the virus. But like many viruses, if you're healthy, if your immune system's strong, you're not going to see the virus as well, right? It's going to be there, but maybe it's just not expressed in a particular way. Um, so I think... Um, if you're seeing really bad symptoms of this virus, one of the greatest ways to correct your tree and make it healthier, I would first focus on the soil, right? Improve the soil health, improve the health of the tree. Now, but assuming your, your tree is established somewhat, it is healthy, what you can do is rejuvenation prune it. You could very simply just cut it back to healthy wood, wood that's not infected, wood that doesn't appear to be damaged in any way. Maybe your tree is damaged in some way and you can't necessarily see it. Um, you know, maybe under the bark, the cambium is in some way damaged at different parts of your tree. Um, and then of course is limiting, you know, particular, you know, nutrients or something. So what you can do is, is you can even cut it back all the way down to the base. I mean, that's how special these fig trees can be. They're unlike any other fruit tree in this way is that you can still cut them back to almost nothing and they'll still fruit. So, um, they're really special and yeah, you got to be careful sometimes if you do this and you're, you're very, um, harsh with this pruning, you could kill your tree. You know, that's obviously something that you could do, but it's such a special technique that I think, uh, doesn't get enough attention that I've been using actually on very young trees. Typically though, in Ponza's book, this technique is described and really only used for very old trees that are 30 to 50 years old. You've had them for a long time. They're starting to decline. Um, they're starting to lose production, yada, yada, yada. And you can cut them back to almost nothing, excavate a lot of the soil away from the top layer of the soil, exposing those roots. And you're going to encourage something called, I believe it's called an adventitious bud where you'll actually have a sucker that comes up from the roots and that sucker or many of the suckers that are going to come up are extremely healthy. They're almost for the most part virus free. Um, and you can, of course, uh, allow those new suckers to become, you can select that sucker as the new trunk of your tree, kind of restart your tree and, um, give it new vitality, honestly. Um, so I've been doing that even here. I don't have 30 or 50 year old trees, but I do have them. I have trees that are very young and you could do that on any sickly young tree, assuming it's established enough. And I've seen great results, um, completely shaking the virus. Um, now. I've killed a few trees too. So you have to be really careful with this. Um, I wouldn't do it on a tree that you're, you desperately love or you don't have a copy of as an example. Um, but yeah, it's great. It's one way to really make your tree one season. It could be totally unhealthy. And because it's so unhealthy with this virus, by the way, guys, is that you're losing out on production. Your tree is just not going to produce many fruits until it eventually shakes this virus to the point where it is healthy and can actually form fruits and a lot of the the uh, varieties unfortunately in california especially you know that the usda has are really they have been exposed to a lot of this virus over the years i don't know what this current state of those trees are right now but i know they've been trying to focus on making them healthier and they've been sort of ripping trees out i would assume and, and planting new trees in their place that are a bit healthier um one way just very simply is just to cut it back to almost nothing you know, um, and let those new shoots come up from either, let's say a lower point of the soil on a bud that's on a lower point, or even just the sucker is really the most ideal scenario. Um, yeah, so that's uh, a really interesting topic. I think it's worth uh, talking about. And we can move on now to the, the last little portion here. We have a miscellaneous section and just planning and um, propagation and things like that. Does anyone know if there's a time limit on this? Um, am I expected to talk for never? Never. <laughs> as long as you want to talk, we'll listen. <laughs> I'm assuming we're going to have questions at the end, right? 
I'm actually keeping track of the ones that have not been uh, replied to in the chat box, um, but you can also scroll through the chat window. There's oh. several. Okay. I'll get to those at the end. Anything in the chat? Um, okay, so um, let's talk about propagation really quickly. Um, mostly figs are propagated by cutting, but there's so many ways to propagate them. Uh, grafting, I think, is a great way to propagate your fig trees, and I would highly recommend experimenting with specific rootstocks. Um, I've seen some rootstocks that are root not nematode resistant for people in the south. That's really critical. That have highly uh, infested soils. There's a variety called LSU Purple that's showing great resistances. Um, also, I would highly recommend a very vigorous rootstock. Typically, the more vigorous the rootstock is, the more productive your tree can potentially be. Um, just in having, I think, a stronger root system for me is my, always my preference. Um, and that's just across the board with all of my fruit trees I've had here. I really don't, I don't find the dwarf trees to be that great. And of course, that depends on your soil. And there's so many different reasons that could be. But uh, there are such a thing as dwarf fig varieties. And one of them actually is called Little Ruby. You can find that very easily, um, different nurseries online. And Little Ruby, I've noticed having it in the ground for about three years now, is it really would make a great rootstock for anyone as a home gardener that wants just a smaller tree. Um, so it's really worth looking into. There's a few varieties that are very quite dwarf and you can determine the vigor of a fig tree by the diameter of the wood. So if uh, the diameter of the wood after so many years is much thicker than something else that's quite thinner, you can measure in a certain way, you can compare them and determine which varieties are less vigorous. And typically the thinner the wood is at the end of the season, the smaller the tree is. Not always the case, which, which you know, what's weird about a lot of these dwarf varieties too, is that they, they typically tend to, not when they are used as rootstock, but when they're on their own roots and you observe them, they typically have a very closer node spacing and they typically put out either smaller fruits, but many fruits. And it's just an interesting difference. Um, it'd be really, I think, interesting to compare uh, at some point in the future how the the vigor really affects different parts of the tree. Um, and I guess quantify that in better terms. But I, I highly recommend if you had a really special fig variety that you really liked, I would highly recommend planting it on a rootstock. Uh, that's very vigorous. Like um, there's many of them out there uh, that you could find. Um, LSU Purple is a great rootstock. Uh, LSU Tiger is an insanely vigorous rootstock. Raspberry Latte is one that's pretty popular uh, that John Verdict made pretty popular in California. There's also a, a Palmata Hybrids. There's the DFIC0023 that is extremely vigorous and would make a great rootstock. Um, Brown turkey is a great rootstock. Um, you know, anything that has a thicker diameter to the wood, I would just experiment with it. And I think you're going to have uh, just overall more and better success with that tree, personally. Um, okay, so then planting your tree. Oh, by the way, propagation is um, not normally done by seeds. I'm sure many of you know that. Um, in that only 25% of the offspring will be a common fig. And you know, the species of Ficus carica, when you're planting seeds, it will come in four different types. The common fig, the San Pedro type, the Smyrna type, and the male capra fig. Uh, the common fig is only the one of the four that fruits without pollination. And some of you guys in California may have a male tree or may have a male tree in the area with the blastophaga, which is the specific species of fig wasp that is specific to figs and pollinating them. Um, That'd be great. If you had that, that's awesome. The pollination tends to increase the quality and the size of the fruits. Um, and for people in dry places, it seems to be a great option if you can make it work. But it's not really typically something that's relied on. Um, and if you had a Smyrna type, but you did have a male in the area and you had the fig wasp in the area, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have great pollination of your Smyrnas. So the Smyrnas require the pollination of the main crop, 
the San Pedro figs require pollination in the main crop as well, but they will produce the Brava crop without pollination. Uh, one of the very well-known figs that is a, a San Pedro is called Desert King. Highly recommend it for anyone that's trying to uh, have a great Brava crop. Uh, even here, I would recommend it. And then a Smyrna that I'd recommend for you guys in California, if you're interested, is um, in Chario Preto or um, Unknown Pastelliere, they call it. The Unknown Pastelliere is probably the most intense berry-flavored fig I've ever eaten in my entire life, and it just is mind-blowingly intense in terms of berry berry flavor. It's, uh, it's like eating a wine in some way. Um, so you have a real special treat if you're able to get that variety. You're able to have the male figs. You're able to have the... Uh, the fig wasp, I would highly recommend you try it. Um, and if you're seeing a lot of fruit drop, again, this could be part of the reason is that maybe you need, you have a tree that requires pollination in some way. Um, in terms of planting these trees, this is a big topic. And uh, we talked a little bit about the soil, so I'm not going to go too deep into that. But really playing around with the planting depth, depending on where you're at, I think is really advantageous so for me and a lot of people who are in shorter season places and it's not too extremely cold you know I would plant them above grade I would plant them in a mound that's one to two foot high um, I've experimented in the past with four inches above grade six inches above grade uh, I planted them in raised beds that are have wooden sides to them um, I have currently fig trees that are in one foot high raised beds with wooden sides to them um, they love all that excess heat in the spring, as I mentioned, and that goes a really, really long way. The problem is if you live in a cold place like I do, you have to kind of insulate the roots a little bit because they are above grade and that's a more vulnerable, uh, part of the tree in terms of the cold. But for you guys in California, it, really dry places in California or really warm places in California, it could be to your advantage actually instead to plant the fig tree below grade. Um, now, I've also experimented with planting my trees three feet below grade, two feet below grade, a foot below grade. I don't necessarily highly recommend that here. It can have its advantages in terms of getting your fig tree through the wintertime, but something that Montserrat Pons does in Spain, actually, and he mentions this in his planting section of his book, is that you can plant your fig tree five feet below grade. And the deeper you go, the more stable the, the soil temperature is, right? So if you grow out a fig tree in a container and it's a whip and the, the tree is about five feet tall or over five feet tall, you plant the root ball all the way down there at the bottom of the hole. Um, now, what this is going to do, because the fig tree is kind of like, you know, it roots very easily. As I told you about my grandfather, he just stakes, puts the, the sticks right in the ground, the branches right in the ground, they form roots. So you very easily are going to form roots, a big root system, very quickly in a short period of time, especially in warmer places like you guys. And you're going to have a very established tree very quickly. Not only that, but you're having your fig tree now in an area of the soil, if you can even do this, I mean, not everyone can even get five feet down, but if you could, you're now having access to a bit more water, right? You can imagine um, it's a bit cooler down there. Your tree isn't going to be as stressed. You're already having the roots down a bit deep and, um, you know, having problems with drier soils is, is just not going to be necessarily as big of an issue. So, there's many advantages and it really depends on where you live and what your climate's like and what your soil's like. And, you know, um, it's something that maybe you guys want to consider in the future, you know? Um, okay. So, uh, let's move on now to the pests. I know the big one that's come up in California is the black fig fly. This has actually been in Europe for a while. Uh, a friend of mine in Italy has talked about it, um, in the past, um, he has a commercial orchard there, but, uh, you know, it's obviously not great. And, um, I would highly recommend, I know there was a write up in the, uh, the newsletter. You guys know better than me about this pest. I don't have it. I haven't learned much about it. So I would read the newsletter and see what other growers are doing. I know it infects the fruits, um, and it creates holes in the fruits and a lot of the fruits fall, uh, down off the trees with holes in them. 
it's something to pay attention to for sure. Uh, some other common pests though are things like scale and spider mites and fruit flies and wasps, ants, borers, nematodes, slugs, animals, if you could put them into that category. Um, you know, just in general, I would just pay attention to the wood, make sure there's no borer damage when you're doing your pruning or even just a couple times a year for you guys. Uh, I would not really leave any fallen fruit on the ground. That's my personal recommendation. You don't want to give these pests or animals or critters just an excuse to have food nearby and uh, make the problem worse. So that's just my general recommendation. Um, in terms of some miscellaneous things, uh, I've had a lot of people ask me over the years about planting fig trees close to their house. I have mine, so many of mine planted next to my house because it's just so cold here and we need that extra heat. Um, I've seen a lot of fig trees of people planted next to their house and big fig trees in different parts of the country. And, um, I don't know exactly where I stand, but I haven't really even heard a very, uh, a very specific instance of somebody having a problem with this. Um, it seems to be that people just generally recommend that you don't do this, but I haven't actually met someone or talked to someone who has had a problem with their foundation. Um, in fact, John Verdict in California, I think he's in San Diego, has a very large vista planted up against his house that's been there for, I think, 15 or 20 years. So uh, I don't know. It's up to you. I'm not going to say do it or don't do it, but I have mine against my house, and that's, you know, it's been okay so far. Uh, ripe figs, like I said before, they'll be seen anywhere from about 65 to 130 days later. They'll be ripe after they form on the trees um, or after you pinch the apical buds. And this number is heavily influenced by soil temperature. So I've said this before, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, coastal areas, Northern California, that are just dark and dreary all the time, try to increase the soil temperatures because what's going to happen is someone like in those areas, you guys may form your figs way before I do. You know, you may form them in March. You may see them visible on your trees in February or March. But here, um, you know, I'm not even seeing them on my trees until about June 1st. But some of you guys, I actually end up ripening fruits at the same time as, as you guys in California. Well, why is that? If you see the fruits visibly on your trees months before I do, how is it that in my climate, because it's just, it really is just so warm here in the summer, a flip is, a switch is flipped and all of a sudden we're in summer, you know, sometime in June. So, um, it's really critical, I think, to get those soil temperatures right for so many reasons. The, for, the fruits form in three different stages. I get this question all the time. Ross, why isn't my fig tree growing or the fruits are not growing? They're not ripening. Well, they form in three stages. They smart, start out of the small pea-sized fruits, and then they are very going to very quickly expand to a particular size. And then they're going to stay at that size for about 30 days until, again, swelling to a larger size almost overnight you may not even notice it and then they're going to stay stagnant once again at that particular size so people who are observing them and seeing them not do anything it's just natural this is just what they do some varieties have about three stagnation phases um, some varieties only have two and it just depends on the the variety um, and then eventually after those 65 to 130 days roughly they're going to start swelling becoming soft and then you're going to be able to pick them and that's leads me to the last point here about harvesting it's really critical uh when when actually harvesting your figs is to really pay attention to the neck of the fig people mess this up all the time and i want to just i just got to shake my head because when you see the latex that's obviously a sure sign that it's not right but a lot of people are feeling different parts of the fruit. You're feeling the bottom of the fruit. You're feeling the body of the fruit. You're even touching the stem. You're looking at the fruit. You're seeing the colors of the fruit. You're seeing the cracking in the fruit. Yeah, some of that's going to contribute to maybe your overall decision of whether or not you should pick it. But the main thing you're going to look for is if the neck is ripe. And, you know, it's because the figs ripen, by the way, from the bottom up. So if you're feeling down here on the bottom of the fruit, what is that doing? right? You, the bottom's right, but the top isn't right. If you feel the neck and you know the neck is right, well, then the rest of the fig is right. 
So that's just really the biggest thing there. And that's what you're kind of looking for is to see the fruit start to droop down because the neck is soft. Um, and the softer it is, typically the more ripe it is. And typically, I think personally, my taste buds, the better it is. So, um, yeah, let me, I, you know, let's go into the questions here. Um, and then I'll cover a lot of the varieties. Okay. Any research on the use of particular films as a way to deal with the fig fly? Again, I'm not really experienced, unfortunately, with it. Ross, would love to know how the plant is doing from uh, from the stick that your grandfather bought over 15 years ago. Yeah, well, Gene, unfortunately, my dad didn't like wasps and grew up with figs in his yard and is apparently afraid of bees, so he ripped them up out of the ground. And it wasn't until many years later that I planted them myself and grew them myself that I have figs. And now he loves them. So, you know, everybody's different. Um, what is the range of bricks? Uh, it depends on the variety. You could see some of them in the 20s. You could see some, depending on how ripe they are, in the in the teens. Um, I've seen people grow figs in the and uh, have a bricks actually in the 30s. So bricks are the um, soluble sugars in the fruit. Okay, why is rain such a bugaboo for figs? We have very little experience with rain here. Well, um, I was going to get into this, but I thought because you guys are from California, it just wouldn't really be um, that useful for you guys. But something interesting um, on my blog, actually, that I've talked about very recently is the shape of figs and why the shape is so important. And here's an interesting little diagram here is that every fig has a different shape. Typically, um, the shape, however, is probably the most consistent descriptor of figs. So if you're trying to identify figs, looking at the shape of the fruit is probably the most important and most reliable descriptor of identifying a fruit. Um, it is the most consistent across all climates. So if you grew a fig in Malaysia in the tropics and you grew a fig here in California, the shape should be relatively the same. Um, so there's six major shapes, and this is what a lot of um, really dedicated fig growers uh, that have published uh, literature and, and special documents on these figs, this is normally what they refer to the, the shape as. And they have different words for it depending on what language they're speaking, right? This is a Spanish version here from, uh, from Monster at Ponds, but you may see words like oblate or uh, ovoid or spherical. Uh, they're just really descripting uh, the shape of the fig. I like to think of pyriform here as kind of like a teardrop shape. Um, the ovoidal is really an oval. The spherical's are, are quite flat or squatty or very circular. And then your ciolato here is very typically like this one, which is called black Madeira. And we're going to get into that in a minute here. And... Uh, Typically, the flatter the fig, typically the more round the fig is and not oval shape it is and slender, uh, typically the worse it does with rain. So uh, the worse it will do with splitting, the worse it will shed the water from the fruit um, because what's happening here with splitting is that you end up having some absorption of water from the rain. And if you have a slight depression in your fruits, it's across the board, and water collects there, the water is then absorbed into the fruit, and then the fruit expands too quickly. And because it expands too quickly, it tends to split. So I try to look for fruits here that not only have the right shape, but they also hang in the right way. And one of the fruits here that I really, really like for rain resistance and, and splitting is um, any of the Celestes, but one that I really like, and you can really just see this really well, is called Moro de Caneva. And you can see how oval the shape is and how well it would shed water. The water is not really going to hit the eye, you know, unless it's a really bad rainstorm. This is the most sensitive part of the fig. So if you had a fig like uh, Black Madeira, where a lot of the, the figs, unfortunately, are so flat, and typically they 
the neck is quite firm for quite some time, and the neck is also quite short. The stem is quite short. Typically, the fig doesn't necessarily hang all the time like this, or it takes a while for it to hang like this. And in that process of it swelling and getting soft and changing color, it becomes more and more and more susceptible as every day and every hour goes by to having this water absorb into the fig and expand and split the fig. So what you don't want especially is that you don't want any of water to be absorbed on the eye of the fig because that's the most sensitive place. And if you have absorption there and you have too much expansion there, it's gonna split very quickly and very easily. So um, I don't recommend a lot of varieties for people who are in these humid places even maybe coastal places where it's quite humid. Um, don't grow a fig that doesn't have a long stem or doesn't have a long neck and doesn't have a slender body. Think about the fig and visualize or observe your figs in a way that, how does it hang from the tree? How is it, um, it you can even see, these are the unripe figs of Moro de Caneva and they're already pointed towards the ground. You know, they're almost already on that right angle that we want to allow them to shed water better. So if you know you have a fruit that unfortunately is like black Madeira, a lot of the fruits, their eyes are pointed up right to the sky. And if you just have one day of rain or a light amount of rain at the wrong time um, in this swelling process, you're just going to have a fruit that's ruined and split. And if it's split... Again, the interior is exposed to the outside elements and so many things can go wrong and the quality is just significantly decreased of actually enjoying your fruits. All right. Is it necessary to fertilize in-ground figs? It depends on your soil. So I would get a soil test and really cover all your micronutrients, your macronutrients, even your trace minerals, um, it could be critical for you. It could be absolutely not critical for anybody else, you know? And those soil tests will tell you uh, the application rates of the soil of the, uh, of the fertilizer. I didn't mention this, but I personally really prefer something like a 10, 4, 12 for just a general application of fertilizer throughout uh, the season. You know, just a general application of that. I have found to be a pretty good ratio and obviously, you know, it's not perfect. So the smallest container you can grow a healthy fig tree in is um, probably five gallons, as Richard said. Um, I have grown them in, I have them in one gallon containers uh, as just nursery containers to ship to people. And I have fruits, uh, varieties that are fruiting in those sizes. You know, uh, not probably in the most healthy state, especially if they're in there for an extended period of time. But, you know, you can get fruits uh, on very small fig trees in containers. Um, but I would I would do a five gallon um, and you have to root prune as Richard's mentioning here. You have to you have to root prune them and uh, repot them every other year. Um, otherwise they turn into a mess and in fact it can be really difficult to get through those roots with a saw or something and uh, yeah, it's just it's just long term. I don't really recommend growing figs in containers. Um, I've originally started out in containers and I've slowly been shifting over towards um, growing them in the ground. Uh, it just seems to be better in so many ways. And the only thing that I can even say is better in a container. Um, and it's not even all the time. It's just um, in certain places, like climate like my own, where it's quite rainy is that if you were able to, as I said earlier, if you were to cover the container with a plastic bag and prevent all of the water from getting into the container and you were to 100% control every ounce of water that gets to your tree, you will have the highest fruit quality possible, which will be of a higher quality here in my climate than in the ground. Simply because my ground, the, the soil in the ground is just way too 
um, saturated at pretty much all points of the season. So, um, yeah, that, other than that, I can't see of a great use for growing them in containers. Well, if you wanted to trial them is another way. If you wanted to grow them for a short period of time and evaluate them and then make a decision and then eventually put them in the ground, um, to me, it just doesn't make a ton of sense. Even for people who are in very cold places, I've seen um, great results by planting my fig trees in the ground, planting them higher, um, and then also cutting them back to almost nothing. You don't need to protect the top. Um, they will re-sprout from the base and they will be very fruitful if you know what you're doing. If you can get the sunlight to those trees, you thin out the branches. Um, yeah. Yeah, a larger pot is definitely going to get you more fruits. And what is really happening there, though, is that you have more access to sunlight. The larger your pot, the larger your fig tree can grow outwards and reach more sunlight and maximize that sunlight. What is a vigorous rootstock? I mentioned some of those. I'll, I'll try to put them in the uh, in the chat. Um, I do also have a spreadsheet here, actually. I can just show you guys this. So this is my fig spreadsheet where I just obsess over them. And uh, here it is. Here we go. So here's some rootstock candidates here, as you can see. And there's a whole list of them. Varieties that are quite vigorous, I think. Um, that are worth trialing. Okay. Where am I at here? Because I don't want to miss my point. Yeah, Italian 258 is also another vigorous variety as well. Noir de Barbantane. There's a lot of them uh, that I don't even have on this list. This is just not complete. It's not updated. And, uh, you know, I haven't looked at the spreadsheet and in too long unfortunately haven't had much time um, in Shario Preto is the variety that I recommend that is a Smyrna it's a commercial fig it does well yeah I could share the spreadsheet anyone can view this um, copy link this is in the description of any of my videos that I've ever done. A lot of people uh, make use of this. All right, so Bruce is asking me, what are my favorite fig varieties, especially the different flavors? So let's get into that now. We'll talk about the uh, flavors and the textures and some of my favorites. Um, so you can test for bricks using a refractometer. Yeah, so ne uh, Mark seems to struggle here with insects and splitting and birds and then lots of fruit flies. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, kind of the problem here is that it's very humid. And if they split um, and the interior is exposed, they start to ferment. And then, of course, the fruit flies come in and it becomes very, very difficult at a certain point in my season to get high quality fruit. So the best thing you can do is pick up all the fallen fermented fruit. Don't have any fermented fruit in your yard. Um, try to avoid growing varieties of fruit that just split or ferment. Um, the birds, you know, there's many different options for the birds. What are the varieties of figs that are dried on a string that they typically sell at Italian markets? Uh, Italian markets where? In the United States or in uh, Italy? Uh, no, it's not all from personal experience, but a lot of the claims I've been making here in um, the first part of our talk, uh, a lot of that, some of that is my own, from my own personal experience and my own personal opinions, whereas some of it is also from established literature or um, other growers that really have done this for a long time or from growers in different parts of the world that I've talked to and have consulted with 
and just shared ideas. You know, um, you got to bounce ideas off other people, right? To come to your own uh, opinions. All right, so let's talk now about some of these varieties. Um, there's th really three main varieties that everybody should know, especially in California, because they just are the best um, and they're widely available and you just have to try them. I mean, um, you know, you're going to have to maybe pay a little bit for them. Um, but um, yeah, it's just as something you may have to go through. But eventually, and as time has went on, they're becoming so popular that everybody sort of has access to them. And maybe you even know somebody in the California rare fruit growers that probably has cuttings of this particular variety um, or these particular varieties. Uh, so the first one here is Black Madeira. This is a fig that uh, is probably like a rite of passage for every fig hobbyist. If you want to get really hit by the fig bug, I think this is probably a great place to start. Um, you taste one of these and it's really well ripened, you're going to be like hooked. And you're just going to be like, okay, what, what even is this? You know, how does nature even produce something like this? Um, it's a very highly uh, flavored and tasting fig. Uh, and it's across the board... I don't really know anyone that doesn't like it. I mean, if you get it and it's well ripened and you like figs and you like fruit, you're going to like this fruit. Um, pretty much can guarantee that. And the reason for that is it's extremely sweet. It's one of the sweeter varieties. It has a lot of nectar that pulls up in the void um, and it usually comes out of the eye. Um, also, what's really special about it, and typically you don't find this in too many fig varieties, is that the berry flavor is quite intense. So it has a very rich, um, interesting, complex berry flavor that I think uh, is just impressive to a lot of people's taste buds. You know, um, yeah. So I, just for that reason alone, I think people really. Uh, highly recommend this variety uh you want to know the history of it the history is a little foggy it's a little unknown um obviously it's called black madeira so you would think it's a black fig from the, the madeira island right but we don't necessarily know and if people have even gone to to madeira and even looked for this fig and it's just you know i mean the, the origins of figs unfortunately are always so foggy um you know, figs have been grown for a very, very long time. And it's just like, it'd be crazy to really claim and say that 100% this fig came from this exact location. You know, I think figs travel so far and wide that uh, over the many years now that people have been growing them, that it just makes sense to me that uh, if you found it in one location, it it almost always pr probably didn't even originate there. I mean, uh, how do we even have proof of this? It's just, it's crazy. So to focus on the true, true origin of these fruits is a little insane to me. People really love this kind of thing. And, um, you know, my hat's off to them, but uh, it's not something I think maybe I'll ever know in my lifetime. Maybe we will with science. I'm not sure. But the point is, is that this is a fig that's supposed to come from the island of Madeira. There is a really well-respected fig grower uh, named Lampo in Portugal, and he has been growing this variety for many years, and he claims that it's called Valetta, Violetta, which is its, I think, you know, at least one of the names for this fruit um, at one particular time. And then the, the USDA imported it, and, and it's been in the... Uh, you know, been growing there at the repository for a number of years. And because the USDA had made a lot of different varieties uh, accessible to the public and it distributed them years ago, and this is like uh, probably eight years ago that they stopped. But, um, you know, this was one of the varieties out of that whole collection that they had that so many growers were just became very in, interested in and impressed with. And, um, ever since then it's kind of exploded you know and um people just say this is just kind of what you have to do is grow this fig it's i believe immortalized itself in like fig history <laughs> and uh you know uh, i think people will always respect it to some degree the problem with it though is it you know as great as it is it just is not a fig for every person's climate you can get some ripe figs here in Philadelphia. Let's say I had uh, 50 figs on my tree. Maybe only five of them would be pretty decent enough for me to eat and actually enjoy them. 
The real problem, though, guys, is that in these other climates that are not really conducive to ripening high quality fruit, maybe even for Mark, who was saying that he has all these problems, is that you just really struggle to reach the quality that you know the figs can reach. And the variety that reaches that quality the most consistently is going to taste the best most consistently is going to be the probably the best variety for you. Um, so low black Madeira, I would argue is in my scale, it's like a 4.8 out of five. That's, that's where I rank it. And so I don't think it's the best tasting fig, but because I'm only ripening about five of them that are of any quality, what's the point? When I can have a, a fig that, let's say, also has 50 figs on it, and I'll ripen every single fig on that tree, and maybe they're not a 4.8, but maybe they're a 4.2. You know what I mean? So for me, it's just way more worth it to grow something that just performs a lot better here. Here's kind of some photos of the inside of this fruit. Um, it has a very thick skin. A lot of people don't necessarily tend to like that. That's probably the one downside of the flavor, but this makes it pretty darn good in terms of shipping and handling. And um, yeah, it's very sweet. Um, yeah, so the thicker skin, it could be a good thing or a bad thing, right? Um, it depends on what you're doing, if, what you're using the fig for. If you're selling it, you're shipping it, you're handling it a lot, a thicker skin, a tougher skin is typically better. A lot of figs, unfortunately, you can touch them, and the thin the skin is so thin that you will actually rip the skin just by putting a finger on it. So um, black Madeira is certainly not like that. You can touch it and feel it, and it won't necessarily fall apart in your hand when it's ripe. Um, and then, of course, the the thicker skin makes baby. You know, there, there is some thoughts I've had on the different elasticity of the skin and how firm the skin is and how that relates to actually splitting. I believe the, the thinner the skin, or at least the, let's say, not maybe not the thinner, but the, the less tough it is and less firm it is, allows it to hang better on the tree. And the neck can actually start to hang in the right way. And you can see here's a variety called Smith that we're going to look at and that the neck is so soft that it's hanging in the right way to help it shed that water or at least not have the eye really pointed up towards the sky and uh, and ruin the fruits. So, um, yeah, that's kind of Black Madeira in a nutshell. Is it ripens very late and it splits very easily. And for those reasons, I feel like, and it tastes very good, you got to try it, but the unfortunate reality is it's probably going to not be your best performer. Um, all right, so the next variety here is called Smith, and this is just like, um, actually, let me go to my, this is a recent blog post I did on Smith, but I have a variety review here. So the the history on Smith, and I would actually put it, I know I said here that a while ago it's a 4.7. I think it's probably a 4.9. I think it's just consistently probably one of the most consistently highly flavored figs that I grow in this climate. I enjoy almost every single one of them. This is a fig for anybody that lives in a rainy, humid place where you struggle with splitting, you struggle with moisture, and you want something that tastes really, really good. Um, so the most credible information I've heard about the history of it is that it comes from Croatia and somehow made its way to France where the Becknell family picked it up and then they brought it to the United States. The Becknell family was a, uh, they still have a nursery today, Becknell Nursery down in the South, and they made this variety extremely popular, um, as well as other varieties like Celeste and Brown Turkey, I believe. Um, but this is one that they really spread all over the South for good reason. I mean, it just performs so darn well um, in the South and um, in the Northeast, anywhere where it rains, um, it's just so well adapted. And um, so it's kind of like a, almost you could say a Croatian heirloom or even a, f a French heirloom. And there's a fig actually that's been coming a little bit more popular today that I, I believe, I, you know, I have to really observe it firsthand, but I believe it's, it's from France and it's called Sessac. And I actually think it could be 
Smith, or at least another name of it, or maybe even potentially not the same thing, but have different uh, minor variations uh, due to, you know, mutation. Um, but regardless, uh, this fig is really known as a, a U.S. fig, right? A lot of European growers, um, you know, don't necessarily have access to this fruit, and they refer to it as a Europe as a, U, a U.S. fig. But none of the figs originated here. You know, they had to come from somewhere. And um, I just truly believe this fig's probably a little bit more popular in, let's say, France or somewhere than is uh, led to believe. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's a really popular fig in terms of LSU because as well, it's, it's not only has it been so prized for, uh, you know, growing in the South, but LSU even apparently had used it in their breeding program and they created a fig called LSU strawberry or strawberry is what a lot of hobbyists refer to it as. And, um, yeah, it's just a, quite an interesting fig with a lot of history, you know? Um, and I believe, uh, personally, as of this year, it's really been impressing me a lot in terms of the, um, the texture. And we're going to get into this a lot and why I believe Smith and the next fig that we're going to talk about is so impressive is that the texture is just off. It's just out of this world. You know, um, as I said in the, in the beginning is that figs are like jam on a tree. Some figs are like cake on a tree, and it depends on your climate, how well you can really ripen these things and how warm it is. But some of these figs have such a thick and dense texture to them, um, and the, the skin sort of forms this you know, nice little wrapping for the pulp, and it really does remind me of like I'm eating cake or I'm eating uh, something as thick as like uh, a pancake or, or like pancake batter. Um, there's just something about them that, uh, they're just so thick in their pulp. And a lot of that has to do with something called, um, the acnes of the fruit. And, um, hmm, how do I show you guys a photo of this? But individually in the ins inside of the fig is all these little flowers. This is an inverted flower is what a fig is. So all these little they, they call them acnes, have different lengths. Um, and this is where the fruits are kind of present, all these little individual fruits. And depending on how long these acnes are and how dense these acnes are, can determine greatly the texture of the fruit. And um, you may end up having, you know, uh, something that's quite meaty, um, resembling meat or something that's uh, quite jelly-like, um, something that could be very syrupy or has a lot of juice or nectar to it. Um, there's so many factors that kind of goes into the texture of these figs, but typically the ones that are my favorite and I think probably would be, um, at least if you like jam, it would be your favorite as well, is if they were quite sticky. Some of them can be very sticky, um, stick to your tongue, kind of stick to your teeth, coat your mouth. And then, of course, even further down the uh, spectrum are figs that are so thick that they're kind of like cake. And Smith, in my mind, historically has been very sticky this year um, until I had some fruits when it was really warm and very dry a few weeks ago. Um, I had some fruits that were approaching the level of a cold Adama, which the cold Adams is the epitome of a very thick, thickly textured fig. And this is the ones that I kind of compare to cake. So if you've never had a cold Adama, you don't really even know what I'm talking about. Um, because none of the figs in terms of their texture, well, that's, I wouldn't say none of them, but overwhelmingly 99% of them are just not like this, at least here. Some of them, if you grow them um, where you guys are at, it's very hot, it's very dry, you have the perfect conditions, you may get a texture like this more consistently than I do. Um, but the cold Adama basically is like this all the time. It's just, uh, it's just the most pleasurable eating experience because of the texture. Um, and of course, Smith has been really approaching that 
for me this year with quite a few of my fruits. And the berry flavor is quite high in it. The sweetness is quite high in it. It even has some acidity. It's very exquisite. The eating experience, you can just tell. It's just everything about it is just like on another level compared to most the average fig. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, that's for me, the biggest thing about it is that I love the flavor. Um, it does require a lot more light than, um, most varieties. So it's adapted to higher light conditions. So if you have a, a yard or a spot that only gets about eight hours, I probably wouldn't recommend it. You need a little bit more than eight hours, um, and a quite of an intense light to really get this thing to be productive. Um, so it can be challenging this fig, no, no doubt, but if you get it in the right climate, in the right spot, it's just, it is just one of the best. Um, so the, the cold Adams, let's show you guys a photo of the cold Adams that I have. Whoops. So here's a fig that I ripened years ago called, um, Col de Dom Blanc. And they really come in three main types that you guys are going to find, at least in a common form. There's Col de Dom Blanc, there's Col de Dom Gris, and then Col de Dom Noir. It just corresponds to the color of the skin. What's weird, though, is that, um, you know, the color of the skin is different, but that doesn't really matter because the interior is what really determines the flavor. And um, it's a great lesson on flavor that I've touched on a lot in this uh, spreadsheet that I've, I've mentioned is that all these figs have a different colored interior and the colors usually correspond to, not always, but they usually correspond to different flavors. And the different color pulp you have, um, as I said, like, yeah, I just said that. So it, it corresponds to a particular flavor. So usually the brown colored interiors represent figure flavors, things like raisins and dates, American persimmons, um, you even have figs that kind of have a caramel like flavor to them. And that's typically I find because of the nectar and the type of sugar within these fruits can be quite different and give it more of a, a caramel like flavor. There's even figs. I, we, we call them honey figs. A lot of growers call them honey figs because they're white or amber in the interior. And typically they taste a lot like brown sugar, but, uh, you typically see a lot of honey on the inside. Um, or that nectar resembles a lot of honey and can got it, kind of give people the uh, idea that it tastes like honey. Others I find have interesting skins and spice flavors. I have some like the um, Sweet Joy has tasted like a marshmallow. Others have more of a bitter skin like the Neruccio de Elba. Some can taste uh, spicy like Daloso or LSU Purple. And they even have just weird, interesting coconut flavors or different flavors coming from the skin. So although I said the, the pulp really determines the flavor, there are some flavors from the skin and different varieties that really contribute to the overall flavor. But when we're thinking about things like honey fig versus a berry fig, which is the ones here with the, the red interiors, um, you know, that's typically how we classify them is really by the, the color of the pulp and not by the color of the, of the skin. So the, the cold Adama, um, you can almost kind of see it in here is that there's very few of those acnes. And that's something that is really typical of the varieties that have a very thick pulp to them. And you can see this is an acne here, this white portion this white portion here, all these little individual flowers form this one solid mass. And the less of them there are, or the shorter they are, or less in quantity they typically tend to be, um, can heavily influence the texture and, and also the, the nectar. It seems to me that, at least here, the cold adamas seem to be a bit drier, of a drier pulp. They don't seem to have nearly as much nectar they don't seem to be as syrupy or honey like or whatever it is. And that drier interior also tends to lend itself well to that cakey, dry, you know, bread like texture that you get. Um, so for me, that's the biggest point there with the cold is the texture and then also the 
the flavor is quite incredible too. It really depends on where you live, but it can be quite intense berry. It can be very sweet. But for my money, really what you would want to do and why you would want to grow this is to experience the texture because it's just not found in many fruits. Um, I've sort of made it my goal because I love the cold Adamas so much. And unfortunately, they don't really perform very well here. Um, here's actually the cold Adam grease. You can see it has gray skin on the exterior, but the inside is just as jammy and, and cakey and thick like the, uh, the cold Adam Blanc. Um, so I've made it my mission to find other varieties that will match this thickness or come very, very close. One of the ones I found very recently uh, is called Juale Noir. This one really surprised me. The texture is very, very, very good. Let's see if I can find it here. Here it is. So this one was brand new to me. The tree's not even very old, but the pulp is so thick. Um, it's just mind-blowingly uh, pleasurable. It, it really is. Um, so I found other varieties, and I have actually even here a section of my spreadsheet that uh, the special characteristics where you can see the rootstock candidates. I even have a section here of figs that have a thick and dense texture to them. And you can see this is a nice little list of varieties that uh, I personally think are a much better eating experience because of their texture. So that's kind of the scoop there on the Col de Dames, the Smith, the Black Madeira. Those are the three I highly recommend. There are other varieties like um, that really are standards, you could say. And uh, I would just highly, highly recommend if you're getting into this hobby and you want to grow a lot of varieties, you want to see about some of the ones that just really maybe don't even have a big name, but they, or they're not very rare. They're just in general a standard, right? They're just something that a lot of people can um, rely on. And, you know, it's amazing that uh, in the nursery catalogs that you might find, I mean, one of my favorite websites is uh, Edible Landscaping to get fig trees from. Uh, they're down in Virginia, but um, this is your typical nursery catalog. You know, you got you got Hardy Chicago, you got Celeste, you got LSU, different LSU figs, you got brown turkey and different types of brown turkey. You got the Villa de Bordeaux, you got Canadria. You know, this is also another Villa de Bordeaux here basically by a different name. You got the Texas BA1, which is basically Smith. You've got uh, the Cadota, AKA Dotado. You've got Green Aishia, AKA Adriatic. Uh, you got white Marseille, you got Olympian, which is a type of brown turkey. You got a different type of Celeste here, which is O'Rourke. Uh, so you just have these standards like Hardy Chicago, Celeste, um, brown, different types of brown turkey, Villette de Bordeaux, even Ron de Bordeaux, uh, Dotado and white Marseille. The, all these figs are just like the standards, I would say. And that, Ross? yes. Can we get can you can one graph uh, many varieties onto one single tree? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I've done that myself. Even on container trees, you can do that. So, um, just going back to what I was saying is that uh, these varieties, um, because they are the standards and because they are so widely available, I personally believe that these people who have selected these varieties over time, I think they've done a great job. Uh, the varieties that are actually available to the public just from a nursery catalog standpoint are pretty darn good. I mean, you know, you would say to yourself, well, there's thousands of varieties and I've experimented with hundreds of varieties at this point and I've looked at thousands and thousands of photos of different figs and I've talked to many people now over the years. You just, it's hard to really beat some of these standards that are available, un unfortunately. Um, I mean, as crazy as that sounds, some of these people are just, in a way, they're a little nuts because they grow these very specialized varieties. And a lot of the time, they're not really any better than the fig that costs $7. You know what I mean? Um, so uh, to me, at least, when I'm evaluating and I'm trying to grow these new varieties that I think are worth a lot of people's time, I'm first looking at the standards. I'm comparing them to the best figs that exist, basically that are available. Um, 
And if they're not anywhere better than anywhere near better than these, then I don't even bother. If they haven't, you know, have some sort of uh, advantage in some little way, which I think is in, is interesting. And all these figs are very, very different from each other in so many ways. But you know, in a general sense of recommending figs to like the public or to you guys, I can't really recommend too many other than what's here on this list you know what i mean um so this is a great place to start we found some great ones i think over the years now um and what's interesting though i will mention is that there's so many varieties out there that exist but a lot of them unfortunately have been um named something else when in actuality it pretty much already has a name and um there's so many different Hardy Chicago figs that are similar to other Hardy Chicago figs that just have a different name. Uh, there's many different types of Celestes. There's many sources of Celestes. Some of them have different skin colors. Some of them have different interiors. You know, they, you could classify them as a similar type of fig, right? But they all have different variations and slight mutations of them of themselves that differentiate them between themselves. And I've sort of made it not just a goal of mine to find something that is better than these standards, but also something that is better of a better source of, let's say, Hardy Chicago, or of a better source that is, let's say, Celeste, or a better Violet de Bordeaux. Or a, there's got to be something similar out there that's adapted over time to a particular climate. And it's maybe changed the fig in a particular way and has made it in some way better. So I'm actually growing like 15 different types of Celeste. I'm growing like 10 different types of Hardy Chicago. I'm growing um, a few different types of, of Brown Turkey uh, or just have the name Brown Turkey. I'm growing a few different Adriatic type figs. I'm uh, growing two different types of Marseille. I'm growing, uh, you know, so all of this is really in an effort, as I said, to not just find something that's better than the rest, but something that's better within what already exists and find that really awesome source for my particular climate and maybe it doesn't perform you know as well in let's say california but it's going to perform well where i'm at um all right does anybody want to want me to cover anything else on these particular varieties um, i'm going to cover some of these questions now if you have some questions on particular varieties put it down in the chat and i'll get it to you guys so anwar says that uh, thicker skins growing for better great for growing in hotter climates and i'm assuming that's because they don't typically um they don't typically spoil as easily and they can handle those warmer temperatures So Terry said, does Black Madeira have a Madeira type of sweet wine taste? Um, that's a little out of control, I think. A little too um, of an aggressive uh, opinion. But but uh, it certainly has a wine-like flavor. Um, but I would just classify it as like a berry flavor. You know, um, a lot of these figs, as I mentioned in this, this chart, they have the red interior. They're going to you know have that berry flavor to them to some degree and typically uh, you know a lot of people like to correlate the, the intensity of the red flavor to an intensity of the the berry flavor but that's not always true um, but certainly i would argue the darker the red color on average the more intense the berry flavor can be the more maybe not not even really the necessary the most more complex it can be but um, so I have a category here, which I classified as elegant berry, which I think they have a very complex, interesting berry flavor to them that uh, separates them from other varieties, in my opinion. Um, and this list is still, it's not even that extensive into what I've tasted. I have not updated this spreadsheet in quite some time. The cherry varieties, there are figs that actually taste like cherries and have hints of cherries to them. Others can taste a bit peachy or tangy or citrusy. 
pineapple-y. Uh, you have some that have a lot of that honey flavor and that brown sugar flavor, but they also have some of that fruit, uh, fruity flavor to it. A lot of the Bordeaux berry figs people compare to like a wine, you know, because the, the Bordeaux region of France is big into wine and uh, they think that the, the berry flavor is complex enough to really be reminiscent of a nice, um, you know, a nice, you know, Cabernet or something, um, which, you know, you could say, I mean, any, any berry flavor on these figs, if it's good enough and complex enough, why, why can't you find it in a wine, right? I mean, it's just kind of, I think it's a question we kind of, um, or a thought that's kind of overblown a little bit. Madeira has a toffee-like taste. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, um, what's interesting though is that a fig grown in California isn't gonna taste the same as a fig grown in Philadelphia. So as I'm describing a lot of these flavors to you guys, you won't necessarily really know how they're going to taste until you taste them where you're at. Um, the it's very subjective, and the the uh, flavors are also changed by caprification. So you know, there's a lot that goes into this, and um, just because I don't like a fig doesn't mean that you won't like a fig. In fact, I would argue that uh, you know, a fig here, you know, really has to be something special for it to taste pretty good but just the average fig here is going to be pretty darn good where you guys are at you know you're not going to complain about a fig that i just kind of brush to the side and say whatever um let's see here let's keep going um Yeah, wouldn't that be nice if uh, we could use the DNA of these figs to track them exactly where they're they're from? All right, so Bruce wants to know my top 10 varieties. We'll get to that in a second here. Um, multiple graphs, different one tree. Yes, very possible, very doable, done all the time. So I put the copy of my spreadsheet in here. I'll do it again. So what's the difference between uh, apical bud pinching and argentile pruning? So the argentile pruning is you're going to do the same thing. You're going to pinch the apical bud, but it depends on when, right? So um, if pinching is done typically in the summer, right? It's kind of like a type of summer pruning. Or let's say in the spring after the branches have started to uh, grow to a certain length. A lot of people like to do it around at the fifth or sixth leaf, right? You can wait, you can do this anytime you want. Typically though, I would say the better, the earlier you do it, um, the better off you might be at getting some fruits form at an earlier date. Um, now the Argentile pruning though is done really right after bud break. So this isn't done um, when you have five or six leaves, this is done before you have any leaves. So you're removing that apical bud as it's starting to expand and leaf out. Um, and that is hopefully, according to Pons and that particular method of pruning that's in his book, it will increase the size and the quality of the Brabus. Maybe it's just the first um, big So anyone that doesn't know, by the way, Figo Preto is just another name for Black Madeira. It's basically the same thing. Yeah, and there's a number of names for so many of these figs. It's just, it's kind of crazy that uh, you can see here in the review of my Black Madeira is that I have some a list of different names that are pretty well known that uh, you could see that if you had one, it's probably not worth growing the other. Um, because they're just so similar. Um, Art says, I make mead. Are there fig juice sources you'd recommend? <laughs> I don't know. Um, couldn't help you there. Sorry, Mark. Mark says, I have a guess that many varieties are actually the same variety, which can be determined by DNA hybridization. So there's an interesting little th talk on this. Um, 
people have been going back and forth for many years on this. And, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> I originally was of the camp similar to you is that they're all the same and there's not really many differences. Um, and also your under the understanding of, of DNA, you know, I still could be to this day kind of wrong on it, but the way I understand it, at least today is that there are varieties that may share the same genetics, uh, like let's say black Madeira compared to Figo Preto. If you did their genetic, you did some genetic testing, they may have the exact same genetic, uh, chain, but they may have one or two different genes that maybe are on or off, or let's say even slightly, slightly different than the other and giving you a different expression of how the tree is actually performing. And that is, I believe due to mutation. So if you grow them kind of like evolution, you grow them in one location for a particular amount of time, they're going to adapt, slowly adapt to that particular climate, right? So they're going to change in some way. And because these figs travel, because they've been grown all over the world, especially these really special ones like black Madeira, really special and hardy ones like hardy Chicago, you know, they're all over the world. And um, they've adapted very slowly to those locations and therefore make them slightly different than the other. I've noticed that that's definitely 100% true is that you could put together, you know, different hardy Chicago types that have different names, but you looked at them and without a trained eye, you would never be able to tell any differences. But if you let them ripen to perfection, even just the taste of them is going to be very, very different. Um, you know, and the way they perform the shape of the fig, the length of the stem, it's just, there's, there's just so many va variables too, that it's hard to really make a claim and uh, either way, but I'd be interested. I'm always kind of thinking about that topic in the back of my mind. All right. So let, let's talk about my favorite varieties and then we'll kind of end this, uh, this talk. So I don't even have 10. I don't even have a top 10 right now. I have a top eight. <laughs> Maybe at the end of the season, I'll have a top 10. Uh, the problem is though, guys, as I mentioned is that there is, like I said, these so many fig varieties that are so great that if they don't outperform something like this, it just would be really hard for me to say it's one of my favorites. Um, and you need a lot of time to evaluate. You can make some pretty good, um, you know, uh, observations early on in a fig tree's life, but it's just so difficult to get the uh, get some of this stuff right. I mean, there's so many variables. I don't know why this is not coming up. Here we go. No, that's not right either. Here we go. So <clears throat> this was at the end of last season. Um, and I'll tell you this right now. Um, the two best figs I have, and it's really not even close, um, are called Verdino del Nord and Nerucciolo de Elba. Here's actually Nerucciolo de Elba right here on the right. It's a very small piece of fruit. But, I mean, look at that. It's basically black. The pigmentation in it is pretty extreme. But what really separates these two varieties from any other variety that I have ever grown um, is that they have insane drying capabilities. So I've talked a lot about in some of these, you know, reviews here, you could see some of these things like the origin, uh, if it's unifera or bifera, similar varieties, the texture, the size, the ripening period. But some of the things I mentioned are things like rain resistance, split resistance, um, spoilage resistance is another one. These are extremely important characteristics to have for the highest fruit quality possible here. So if I, I did a, another blog post here actually is that these are some of the most important characteristics for high and consistent fruit quality. And we talked about that, yeah, I'm gonna enjoy a black Madeira and it's going to blow me away and I'm going to have this really awesome experience. But if I'm only eating five of them because it's just not a very consistently high quality fig here, then it's useless to me. 
So what I'm looking for is these qualities that give it the just many superior, um, they're just superior characteristics for this particular climate. And although it has really great rain, um, you know, drying capabilities, you know, that may not even be necessarily something that you even look for where you're at. A lot of figs can dry pretty easily in your dry climates, but these have been, they, these dry, these two figs, they dry so easily on the tree that it's just mind blowing that even here in Philadelphia, I can get dried figs. Um, as you can see here, these are somewhat shriveled, approaching dried fruits here of Neruccio de Elba. I even had a variety that was really impressive that I've been really trying to recommend to people. It's called uh, Campaneri. And this is a French variety that was found outside of Paris. But, I mean, look at that. That's like, it's really impressive, and it was raining nonstop. So this is a, the, some figs just have this awesome ability to, continue to ripen, continue to dry on the tree, uh, even though there it could be a little bit of rain, um, even though there could be, let's say, something trying to destroy it, like all the outside elements. Um, there is certain figs that have a high enough bricks or high enough of resistance to these outside elements trying to destroy it that it just continues to ripen without really losing quality. Um, and that's just the key that I look for here is all about the rain. And that's why I was thinking, you know, this probably isn't even that important to you guys because, you know, the fig varieties that I really pay attention to all have a really short hang time. The hang time is defined by fruit that fruit that is hard and green. Once it's hard and green and starts to swell and become larger and change color and become softer, how many days does it take from that point right there until I actually pick the fruit? So a lot of figs have about a seven day hang time here. It depends on the heat, depends on where you guys live. Maybe in California, it's only four or five days. But in that seven day period here, I just have problem problems with, um, you know, anything attacking my fruits, whether that's birds, that's insects, uh, whether that's rain. So if I have a longer period of time that I need my fig to actually hang on the tree and ripen, then there's a longer period of time that something bad can go wrong and I can lose out on quality. So wouldn't I want a fruit that just takes a lot less and shorter time for it to ripen for less things to happen? Um, so that's a really critical thing. And then of course I've, I've learned over the years that to have a better rain resistance and split resistance and cracking resistance and even resistance to temperature swings. And you need to really have a fig that has great drying capabilities that not only can it dry well in a dry climate like you guys or most of you guys, but it can also dry super well in a humid climate like mine. Um, you know, Calamurna is that typical dried fig that you see in dried fruit products or even Black Mission. Um, you know, and that's a great fig. It's got nice drying capabilities. Don't get me wrong, but if I were to try and grow Black Mission here or Calamurna here, and I were to try to dry that on the tree, guess how many days it would take? It's like 20 or 30 days. So if I have 20 or 30 days of the fruit on my tree and it rains like on average, maybe once or twice a week here, maybe even more. I mean, it just rains very recently for like three or four days straight. So if I have that problem, how am I ever going to have a fig that dries or ripens to a high quality in 20 or 30 days? It's like, it's impossible. So the only thing I can look for is a fig that dries very quickly and ripens very quickly. Um, the other things I'm looking for here are the ripening period. Um, specifically, the earlier they ripen, typically the better they are for me. We want to ripen our figs at the usually the warmest and the driest time of the year. For you guys, if you're in such a super warm place, you know it, you don't want to get too carried away with the heat. But certainly when the, at least here, when the daytime temperatures are roughly 90 and the nighttime temperatures are roughly 70, I see the best quality fruits. So for me, getting them early is better than having them late because very soon here around September 15th, there's a switch that flips. Just like I said in, uh, you know, in, in sometime in June, all of a sudden we're in the summer. Sometime around, you know, September 15th, all of a sudden we're in the fall. 
So if I have less heat going from September 15th onward and figs are a fall fruit, well, you know, I'm in trouble, right? How am I going to ripen these fruits at a high quality? Because now we have less heat. So the only real way we can we can do this is really to get them to ripen early and have them ripen quickly. So the, the, the varieties that I choose, Verdino del Nord, Neruccio de Elba, they're just far superior. Uh, here's actually, I'll show you a photo. No. How do I find this? Hmm. Well, I have a photo here somewhere, guys. Let me see if I can find it from last year, September. Here we go. So this here is a plate of Verdino del Nord. And this is basically after a huge rain event, many days of rain, I let them sit on the tree. I let them get it, you know, just decimated. And these were actually very good figs considering the conditions that I had grown them in. And if you look here, this is the figs on that same day. So here's that plate of Verdino del Nord. Here's some decent ones right here. Here's actually some Campanieri. Uh, the other two bowls here, this bowl here and this bowl here, uh, especially this bowl, wasn't ripe enough, had split. And because they had split, they were attracting fruit flies and they were inedible. So I have basically all these fruits here and all these fruits here that are inedible, not very good, not worth my time. I have some random varieties here and random fruits here. I have got some pretty decent Campanieri because it's just a superior, superior variety. But look how many of these Verdino del Nord I have. So it's like, you know, here's the proof of the pudding that it's just such a far superior variety because um, they were all edible and they were actually pretty darn good. Um, so it's obviously my number one. Um, and then number two is right behind it, Marucciola de Elba. My three through six is a bit up in the air right now. And uh, I really, really like, uh, we talked about Smith that one was covered we also talked about um campanieri which i actually put as of last year i put it at number eight but i actually think i think i may even put it somewhere up a bit higher after the end of this season um achieved the argentile is a nice little you... achieved the argentile is a nice little french fig and it uh it really does well in the moisture as well uh it's mid-season it ripens a lot of fruits and the flavor is very interesting. It has a nice little cherry flavor, very sweet. This is the one that really got my mom into figs. She didn't really enjoy figs all that much. She was very off put. She's weird with food sometimes. And it's, it's, you know, it's understandable. I mean, some people just don't like certain foods because of the way they look, or maybe the texture of them is a bit too soft or something. I mean, a lot of people don't like, you know, um, uh, raw fish it's sushi it's just odd to them so this is one that really got her into it um to me it's uh i think it tastes at least last year it was tasting slightly better than smith but this year i would argue smith is better um in terms of flavor um they really wow you in terms of their complexity it's and it's a gray fig it's beautiful um it's a high quality piece of fruit uh, Moro de Caneva, this is one that we, t we touched on a little bit where you can see how well it hangs and how the, the stem length is great and the way that it shed water is great. This is also a commercial fig that's uh, grown in different parts of Europe and has many names. Um, so it's got many uses and it's great for many purposes. And uh, it's obvious why this would be somewhere in my top tier list. Rosalino is a... a um, pretty popular variety in Tuscany in Italy. Um, we don't really know the origin, by the way, of Hattive de Argentile. If you talk to any French rower, no one knows any idea about this variety. This was a variety that the USDA imported, by the way. Um, so none of really the uh, really experienced and well into this hobbyists really have any idea about this fruit, which is really quite strange. 
Um, Rosalino, as I said, it's really popular popular in Tuscany because what they do with it is that they typically use them as dried figs. They'll harvest their fruits um, and then they will dry them and then they'll enjoy them all throughout the winter time. I think it's a it's a, I'm not sure how they I forget how they dry them exactly. I think they string them up and then they dry them in the sun. Um, I have to really I have to be I'm not entirely sure about that. I forget how they do it exactly, but it has really great drying capabilities. So obviously it's going to be very flavorful. This thing was like a burst of flavor in your mouth, um, especially if you can get it quite ripe and starting to get on that drier side. It has a really interesting fruity explosion of flavor. Um, some of these fruits like, um, you know, Moro de Caneva and, and Ron de Bordeaux, um, they don't necessarily dry on the tree here. They do have a great ability to resist spoilage. Um, even if they were to split, they tend to really resist the outside elements well. Um, probably because of their, their high enough bricks or whatever it is in the fruit that's really helping them resist that. Um, and they tend to form this like uh, fig candy rather than a typical dried fruit that you would see. And these these fig candy figs are like, they really are candy. I mean, they just like have this explosion of flavor in your mouth that it's just like, it's, it's just mind blowing. Um, so to even have something like this here in my climate, it's just like such a treat. Uh, cause it's just so hard to come by. Um, the Rosalino is pretty similar to Hardy Chicago, but you know, as I said, there's so many different Hardy Chicago types that you could say there's even close to 80 of them where you might say that they all share the same genetics. This one is different enough to where I wouldn't even classify it and say it has the same genetics. I think it's just a very different fig. Um, but at first glance, untrained eye, you wouldn't really know. Um, and then, of course, Hardy Chicago, I think, is a fantastic variety. Out of all the uh, out of all these standards here that perform well here, Hardy Chicago is obviously a great one. Celeste is a great one. And then also Villette de Bordeaux and Ron de Bordeaux. Um, but Villette de Bordeaux has some issues here. Uh, it, it tends to form some cracking in the fruits. And in those cracks, you can typically get some mold that forms. And for that, I have to dock at some points. Um, it's also not the tastiest fruit here, although it's pretty good. Um, it can be very good. Um, it's also extremely productive. It produces a large Braba. It's just one of the best for sure. Um, Ronde Bordeaux is a great performer here, but it tends to split a bit more often than I'd like. There's a fig called Pastelier that's a really uh, great Italian um, fig of different European origins. And that one has a really great profile for anybody uh, as well. And it might even be very similar to that unknown Pastelier that uh, I recommended earlier if you have the fig wasp. Um, a lot of the LSU figs, like LSU purple, LSU tiger, LSU champagne, LSU huye. These are all just incredibly great figs because they all have Celeste in their parentage. So far, and I think what's going to be in my top 10 very, very soon is the black Celeste, which is a fig actually right here that we, we showed you guys at the beginning of this talk. And it just is the tastiest Celeste I've ever had. I mean, it just is beautiful inside and out. It resists all the, the crap. Uh, it's got the right shape. It hangs well. Um, and the flavor is just fantastic. So it's got everything. And that's really what you're looking for with these standards. And to have something that beats some of these better figs is, does it have it all? You know, is it an overall, that's what this list is about, an overall best fig it's not this is my tastiest fig this is my most dwarf fig or whatever it is you know um this is for every little characteristic you could think of these are the the best in those categories um and as i said if i was going to talk about my best tasting figs then it would have to be the fig that has the the most consistency right black madeira you know, only get five ripe figs off of it. So is it the best tasting fig? Maybe. 
but how many of those do I get? So that's kind of the little talk there, guys. At the end of this, um, we're going to wrap this up here with the uh, last little questions. If anyone has a question, put it down in the chat before, uh, before we go. Ross, may I ask a question? This is Karen Payton here. Uh, and by the way, the, I, if I may, um, and I realize people have been waiting on the chat, but I think the way you frame things, um, whatever is your conceptual approach, and in view of your encyclopedic knowledge, I think this has been looking at the whole area of things from a perspective that really is new to us. My husband had to go for a moment, but uh, this was terrific. We had no idea this would be quite this special. Thank you so much. Oh, okay, thank you. My form okay, thank you. My formal question is, uh, is there an email <clears throat> I could get you at because I would like to be able to get a mailing address for you? Yeah. Here, I'll put my email in chat. Thank you, Karen, for those nice words, by the way. Would I'm, you mind saying it? I'm kind of uh, computer deficient here, just yeah, for uh, efficiency. Uh, do you have my, um, do you have the spelling of my first and last name? Uh, I, oh, I apologize. I know that we had it wrong in the newsletter. Yeah, R-O-S-S. Yes. R-A-D-D-I. Yes, and then it's just at gmail.com. So my first and Perfect. last name. That does it. I appreciate it. And again, I think this was really special, and I know for sure that my husband and I will never approach things in the same way. Hmm. And we come away from your talk with uh, exciting perspectives and um, concepts. It's really bad. Thank you, Karen. I really appreciate those words. I, I, you know, I think um, figs are wonderful, and the more that I'm passionate about them, I think the more it gets other people excited. And uh, I like to share what I love with people. Uh, really, is one of the best things in life. I think I love doing that. So if I have a nice wine that I really like, a nice recipe I really like, that's something I like to share with other people. And Rowan Figs is just, you know, it's it's just out of this world. I don't know if it really gets enough credit, to be honest with you. So I'm happy that you're going to view Figs well, in a different way. you make it a whole different uh, activity and a whole, uh, you bring a magic to it. And that's, that's oh, really thank exciting. You. As soon as we're off here, I'm going to go up and pick Figs and we're going to look at what we can pinch, what we can trim, think about the water, all kinds of things. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'd like to say it was an excellent presentation also. Um, I, I, there are some very big differences between the East Coast and the West Coast in growing, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And I, I find one of the indications of ripe figs, at least here, mm -hmm. is when the fig stem starts to bend all the way down. Mm. And it, that's usually a very good indication for our coast. Yeah, it depends on the variety. Um, and the variety. Right. Yeah. So, But here's the other thing, though, is that are you talking about the stem or are you talking about the neck? The stem. Hmm. Okay. I'm talking about the stem. All right. Yeah, I mean, that drooping habit is definitely critical. And, and uh, you know, the stem isn't necessarily an indicator if you were to touch the stem, see if it was no, right. No, I'm not touching the stem. No, I understand. I, I really appreciate <clears throat> the idea of touching the neck of the uh to see if it's right from that perspective right yeah i'll be using that me method from now on okay cool what are you how do you typically run into some of these more rare varieties is, is it through the the collectors that you know or through the, the bidding some of the big big bids and yeah so i have a lot of friends and different parts of the country and uh we just know each other really well and we share material with each other um uh, believe it or not there is a lot of genetic material that is pretty um rare or unique just here in philadelphia i don't think people really appreciate that uh the amount of immigrants and and italians and uh different cultures that have brought fig varieties to the united states is pretty incredible Anywhere in the Northeast, especially in the Philadelphia, you could drive around and see so many fig trees that 
I've been very skeptical at first to really look for them because um, you just uh, you don't know what they are, and I don't really want to impose on anybody, um, especially here in the Northeast. They're not really maybe as nice as people on the West Coast, but um, <laughs> they're pretty. They're actually pretty nice here because they. I oftentimes <clears throat> will stop at a house and ask questions about something that I see growing. And most of the people here are very anxious to share, actually. Yeah. The other thing is that I'm 30 years old, so people might look at me a little funny and like, what is this guy up to? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I get, but my objective very soon here is to go around Philly and get some figs and then bring them to the people and say, hey, here's some figs. You want them? I want some cuttings, you know, um, and just kind of introduce myself and tell them what I do and things like that. Uh, but yeah, the, the Figbit is a great place to buy them. Um, although if you didn't really want to find all these rare and, you know, mostly unproven varieties, you could just go on Edible Landscaping, I think is a great nursery. I think Just Fruits and Exotic, Just Fruits and Exotics has a great selection. One Green World has a great selection of figs. Um, and mostly they're true to type. You know, sometimes they make mistakes, but, uh, you know, that's yeah, that's my big concern about going to some nurseries. A, a lot of nurseries, even in California, uh, mislabel things that they're selling. Oh yeah, or yeah. They rename things constantly. Yeah, and people don't know what even they are. You know, uh, so um, if you're not familiar with the lingo of fig hobbyists, you're going to be kind of lost on what to even call them and. Uh, you know, it can be difficult for people. So getting it from a hobbyist, if you really want something that's accurately labeled is the best way to do it. Uh, you could, I don't know, I think people who have um, nursery licenses can can get fig cuttings from the USDA. So if you have a nursery, I think you can still apply and uh, somehow get, get cuttings from them. Good idea. I, I used to get them from the... the depositories but i haven't recently okay um let me see here if there's any questions in chat richard gets four inches of rain every year <laughs> i wish um yeah at some point i'm gonna have to grow my figs probably under plastic to really get uh the quality that i'm looking for yeah, so the two figs I really like are uh, Verdino del Nord. Unfortunately, they're just not common right now. I, I recently have come out and said that these are my favorite, and people just went crazy for them. And uh, as a result, I don't have the supply, and many people don't have them yet to really uh, spread it around the country. But it is my mission. You know, I've literally dedicated my life to try to find. Uh, dedicated a large portion of my 20s to try to find amazing varieties like I found that you can grow anywhere and uh, will become, I, I want them to become a part of this catalog to get rid of some of the bad, the worst ones and introduce some of the good ones so that people like Edible Landscaping and One Green World and that's kind of what they're doing already. They've expanded their catalogs pretty intensely over the last few years. Um, SoCal No Rain, we have yeah, there's a big drought there, huh? Do both heat and light affect the fruit? So heat is going to increase the metabolisms of the tree, and the light is going to infect, affect the uh, probably the quality of the fruits and also just even forming the fruits on the tree. Um, the more heat that you have uh, at the time of ripening, below about 95 the better off you are for the quality so you like i said i think the best temperatures are somewhere in the low to mid 90s at during the day and then low 70s at night i think that produces at least the best quality figs here it could be very different for you guys but those are what i'm seeing is the heat is a really big um it's a really big impact on the fruit quality. And not only that, but it, it um, figs are very dependent on the, the weather in which they ripen in. 
so if it's rainy and cold like it is today it's only 70 something like 73 or something crazy and it's been rainy and dreary and i'm having figs ripen right now the figs are really going to stink and they're going to be kind of watered down in flavor and it's just not very good so the other factor aside from the heat a uh, day and night is that you have a much higher humidity factor significantly mm. higher than we do yeah so we may have the temperature but our humidity is going to run 20 30 mm -hmm. where yours might be 50 to 70. yeah so if it's really humid here you're typically going to have less qual lower quality fruits uh it's just uh, a bit of a shame, I think. You know, you definitely notice that on certain days that are a bit drier than others, and you pick the fruits on those days. Um, it, it really contributes, I think, it goes back to the point I was making about the drying capabilities, right? If it's a drier humidity outside, they're going to dry easier on the tree. They're going to ripen a bit better on the tree. At least my personal taste preferences love when they're really well ripened, they're ripened for a longer period of time and they're starting to turn into a dried fig. You know, I don't know if any of you guys have had this fruit, a persimmon before, but there's something called the uh, hoshigaki that you can make. And it really is, in my opinion, the best dried fruit because when you make this, this fruit, um, you, you peel the, the outside of the persimmon, you peel the skin and then you let it dry. A lot of Japanese people or different Asian cultures, they dry them, right? They string them up and then they touch them and kind of squeeze a little bit of the moisture out of them. And then what ends up happening is, you know, they crystallize the sugar on the outside and you get a texture on the inside that can be, depending on how dried you want the fruit, can be very dried or the interior can be like this is kind of a decent example. It can be kind of jammy on the inside. So that's kind of what a dried fig is like, or a semi-dried fig, is that you have this awesome consistency on the outside that's kind of chewy, a little bit tough, and then on the inside is just this pure and amazing, perfect jam that you just love to enjoy. So for me, I think that's where I like them, you know, and that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Those are available in the ethnic markets here in Los Angeles. <laughs> You're kidding me. No, they sell them quite frequently. Oh, okay. Do they sell hoshigaki? Uh, you can find them with a little effort. Oh, my God. Wow. That's that's awesome. Um, no one even knows what that is here. No one even knows what a persimmon is here, for the most oh. part. Um, okay. You're talking to the California Wear Fruit Growers, so <laughs> we, we grow just about anything you can imagine from all over the planet. Yeah. By the way, this is actually my favorite fruit is the persimmon really yeah i enjoy them more than i enjoy figs and the reason for that is here they ripen at a higher quality more consistently than the figs so you put my best persimmon up against my best fig and the best persimmon pretty much always ripens at a better quality and it's just to me it tastes very similar ish if you get them kind of right that's fascinating thank you yeah, am I missing anyone's question here? Where am I at in this? Uh, no rain, no heat, mostly mostly single color. Do you go striped figs such as tiger? I don't. Tiger. Right, I I don't grow any of the ramada figs. That's what they're they're the striped figs are the term that people refer to them as is called ramada figs. And they're basically a chimera mutation, I believe, is what people believe uh, is that they have mutated of a unramata fig or a non-striped fig. So originally Panache or Tiger was a fig called uh, Bordesot um, Blanca. So that was the original non-ramata version of Panache. And then when it became striped, they renamed it because now it's typical. It really is just a different variety. Um, so the same thing with uh, Martinenka, you have uh, Martinenka Ramada, but you also have, if you go to Ponza's website and you look at the varieties here, you could type in another variety here called Martinenka and you can also find Martinenka Ramada. And this is the what Martinenka looks like without the stripes. And here's what Martin, Martinenka Ramada looks like with the stripes. So the, this is the mutation, how it has changed. 
And um, I don't grow really any of the striped figs only because I've learned over the years I don't really want to grow figs like Black Madeira. I don't want to ripen five figs off my tree that are pretty, that are nice, and then the extra 45 of them are so depressing and so disheartening that I put in all this work and I have to throw them away. You know what I mean? So I don't – there isn't really a striped fig other than maybe there's one called Pepone that will really perform well here. There are other figs that are not typical, te technically Ramada figs. Um, so this one here called Parrot Jaw. There's also a Parrot Jaw Ramada, if that's how you pronounce it, excuse me. But there is also a Parrot Jalina. And this one's similar to the other two, but guess what? It has sort of, it sort of has stripes. I mean, even though technically it's not really a striped Ramada fig, the fruit as they ripen does have stripes and typically a lot of the ramada figs as they ripen lose their stripes as you can see here here is an unripe fig and then more unripe and then as it starts to swell you lose these stripes and fortunately some of the fruits do retain the the color but yeah it's just kind of a thing that's just like whatever to me you know i'm over it um how do you know if you have the fig wasp in your area? Um, sometimes you can see them if you're very, very uh, observant and you uh, look at your figs at the right time of the year. You got to get a good pair of eyes. <laughs> you need the probably like a, a magnifying glass or something. I would, um, in that particular instance, I would probably consult with somebody um, that is in your area that grows figs and has the fig wasp. Um, you can observe this probably if you grow a Smyrna or a San Pedro that requires the pollination. And if there are some figs that are getting pollinated, some figs that aren't, and they're dropping, then you know you probably have the fig wasp to some degree. Um, so if you're seeing a lot of fallen fruit on varieties that require the pollination, that's one way. Um, you could also go around and drive around your neighborhood and look for fig trees, you know. Um, they can cover a pretty wide distance too. So that may not really tell the full story. Terry says, are figs historically one of the first fruits? You know, what do I know? I don't really pay too much attention to the history of these of figs because as I said, they're just, who really knows? You know, I'm not really, if I had a good idea, you know, I mean, that's the word on the street, right? But if I really could say where some of these figs came from as an example, and I knew for sure, then like someone bred it and it was their patent, then, you know, that would be one different story, but I don't know. It's not really my interest. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you, Ray. Uh, please spell your number two fig. I got it down there at the bottom. Kathleen says, thank you f uh, for the presentation. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, I don't know if the fig fly, I'm hoping, cross, my fingers are crossed that it doesn't uh, survive here. You know, I don't know where it can grow and where it can proliferate. I don't, there's so much we don't know about it. That's my hope, <laughs> is that it's just too cold here. Um, Terry says, is it true that a, a ripened fig won't exude the milky sap at the stem end? Yes. That is true. When they're ripe, they will not have that latex sap. And uh, I like to pick them well after they lose the sap, by the way. Uh, which type of persimmon do you like the best? I like Seijo. Um, Honan Red is very good. Um, I have a Rosianca tree that's about seven years old, and it produces some really great fruit. I also like the uh, American persimmons. Um, I really enjoy Proc. The, I like the, the astringent types much more than the non-astringent types. So Hychia would be what I go for. Uh, Gene said, I ate the ones made out of Fuyu persimmons, the ones you see in the store. The link is Hychia, yeah. The process removes the bitterness on top, changing the taste and texture. Okay, yeah. There, um, there is a way, I believe, to remove the astringency, too. All right, guys. Well, I enjoyed my time here. I really do. This is an awesome honor. Um, 
it's cool to get recognized for, you know, something you've been doing for a very long, for at least in my life, seven years is a long time, um, to me. And, you know, maybe I haven't been growing figs for 30 or 50 years. Like some people have, uh, I've definitely obsessed over them to the point where, uh, it's a big part of my life. So very soon we're going to be selling some fruits. I decided not to do that this year, even though I have a overabundance, but that's the goal is to sell them commercially and, um, continue to spread knowledge about them and teach people and inspire them and um, really educate people on these different varieties because uh, choosing the right variety goes a really long way. So I thank you guys. Thank you very much. Okay. By the way, if you're Recording market, stopped. If you're looking for a market for your figs and you don't want to sell them to the general public, you can approach uh, the, the high-end restaurants. Oh, yeah. 